Dot as advertised, we do appreciate you waiting. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, we have no apologies, we have a full house. And so I will go straight to public question time. So um, what we would do is that we will deal with the items that have been raised first um, by members of the public gallery. So the first item that was raised this evening was item 7.3, and that is the land exchange and reclassification of land, amendment number four to local planning scheme number two, portion of lot 75 Brentham Street, Brentham Street Reserve for portion of lot 100, number 20, and lot 37, number 26, Brentham Street, Aaron Moore Catholic <coughs> Primary School, consideration of submissions, submissions and conditional contract of sale. In short, Aaron Moore Primary School land swap. Um, are there any questions on this item? Councillor Loden. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on the questions raised from the gallery there, there were a couple that was looking for administration's response on. Um, firstly, uh, the issue of access through that lane, through that piece of land there with the swap of the land. Is, that's currently, is that currently used as an access route and with this change will that, that no longer be there? Um, secondly, what consultation was undertaken? Could you run us through what consultation was undertaken with Rosewood? Um, Thirdly, there was a suggestion that we have not met our statutory process around consultation, so I'd appreciate a comment on that. And then just the final one, uh, just some feedback on the need for uh, Rosewood to amend their evacuation plan as a result of this change. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, in respect to your first question about, thank you, uh, about access. So as you can see on the plan that's attached at attachment eight, um, that shows the connectivity between like Wavertree Place and Britannia Reserve and also the connection between the small, so the pocket park which would be about 1,700 square metres um, under the proposed land exchange between that park and Brentham Street Reserve. Um, as the speaker said, the proposed land exchange would result in no access between Rosewood and the school, so the current one metre wide access way that's there would um, basically the school would now abut Rosewood under the proposed land exchange, so you wouldn't be able to access, um, there wouldn't be connectivity between the two portions of Brentham Street Reserve as there currently is, but there would be connectivity from Wavertree Place through to Britannia Reserve and from Rosewood and Wavertree Place through along Britannia Road to Britannia Reserve. So I guess there'd be alternative forms of connectivity. Um, your second question about consultation with Rosewood. So we did meet um, with Rosewood Aged Care and Lav and Legal on site. Um, I think, I'm not sure if the exact date is in the report, but on page 276 we've detailed the different um, forms of consultation we undertook. So we had a site visit with Rosewood and we talked about the connectivity and the other issues which they've outlined in their submission. Um, and your third point about the statutory requirements for consultation. So because Rosewood, a um, sorry, because the school is a charitable organisation, so Macaulay uh, Property Limited who own the um, land, they come within the definition of a charity. We're not required to comply with section 3.58 of the Local Government Act. So that means we don't have to go through the process of um, disposing of land via an auction, a tender or by providing public notice. Notwithstanding that, we put the report to Council in December, subject to um, going through the process of public consultation, and we've since uh, put public notices up. There have been signs on the fence to let people know. There's been um, notices in the paper. We distributed leaflets to the um, properties abutting the Rosewood Aged Care and like where the, Brent, where the land exchange is. Um, and there's been like notices in the media and on our social um, on our website and social media. And the evacuation plan. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, might have to take this on notice, but my understanding is um, that obviously that is the reserve, so there's no guarantee, like that is the city's land, so there's no guarantee of what that can be used for in the future. So we'll have to look into whether that was part of the approval, perhaps, like, yeah, so we'll provide some details in the um, briefing. Councillors? Councillor Fatakis? 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, um, the other issue that was raised was uh, the retention of the mature trees on site. Uh, can you um, maybe address just that? That was uh, one issue raised by the gallery. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, we've had a feature survey prepared now which shows like the playground and the trees um, on the site and that's at attachment, attachment 7. Um, our understanding is the school has no plans to change what's on the land currently. So all the trees that are currently there, and you can see them on the feature survey, would remain as is. Um, it does mean that I think five of the mature trees that are currently in that um, area of Brentham Street Reserve between the school and the right of way, so and where lot 37, the music house is, they will become within the school's land. So basically five mature trees would be transferred across. Councillor Fatakis, any further questions? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Just a couple of questions, just for my benefit. So with a land transaction or proposed land transaction, the uh, potential receiver of lands from the city has who that is and what their status is as an organisation plays a role in whether or not we have to comply with the Act. Is that correct? So I understand what, what the... Uh, yeah, I would have thought that the Act would relate to the disposition of the land uh, or the, the requirements of the Act were about the process, not who the res potential receiver of the land would be. Through you, Mayor Cole, pursuant to the regulations, so that's local government functions and general regulations, it sets out um, what type of groups, if you dispose of land to them, whether you have to provide, like comply with Section 3.58 in the Local Government Act, so with community, sporting, groups, anything that falls in within the scope of a charity, you don't need to comply with section 3.58. Um, it also applies to state government departments um, and there's exemptions for like residential leases. So it's all set out in the regulation. So it does depend on who you're disposing of the land to. So that's with our leases to sporting groups. That's why we don't have to go through a formal auction tender or public notice process. Thank you. Uh, that bothers me as a citizen of the world, but that's a separate matter. Um, the, uh, in relation to uh, so there, in some of the correspondence that the city received and also um, in Mr Wallace's address earlier he talked about it being presented as a done deal or fait accompli. Can we just get some clarity as to, uh, and I know that we effectively from what you're saying it was our option to actually go out to the community in any way. We would have had the option not even to consult at all which again seems strange to me but uh, in terms of the Act as far as triggers for the way in which it's advertised or the way in which uh, whether it has to comply with um, Section 358 of the Act or otherwise, uh, I guess what the question I have is how would you present a proposal not as a fait accompli if you'd been approached in this way without it going to a public tender auction or otherwise if uh, I guess the, the, the question relates to the, the Council's in principle support but if the Council didn't provide in principle support we perhaps would have no reason to go out so I'm I guess I'm asking the question in the city's your administration's view uh, how is it how would this have been presented in any other way uh, to uh, to not give rise to the idea that it was presented as a fait accompli or a done deal as, as was mentioned tough question I know <laughs> uh, but yeah I, I think you're trying to provide some commentary, but um, there is no other way, is I think what the answer that you're looking for, Councillor Toppelberg. Not necessarily, but I, I'm, yeah. It... Um, through you, Mekol, I guess this has come about because the school currently, some land that's owned by the school or by Sisters of Mercy um, is actually part of, the fence is not on the boundary of that lot, so it looks like it forms part of the Bentham Street Reserve, which is public open space. And then there's land owned by the uh, city, so our freehold land, which is used by the school for that car park, um, also where the dental van parks. So the, this land exchange came about in order to clarify like ownership of land and to align the fences with actual ownership, so that would resolve liability and maintenance issues. Um, um. Just for, in terms of the evacuation plan, I understand the question or concern for, uh, from Rosewood, but in terms of their evacuation plan uh, seemingly having been approved with access to lands uh, or to space that is not owned, uh, not owned by Rosewood, can we perhaps get some advice from FISA as to whether or not 
we have a role to play, given its designation as, as public open space, whether or not that is uh, assumed by FISA to be publicly available and therefore uh, suitable to be part of the evacuation plan, or whether there's an obligation on Rosewood to be to provide evacuation space uh, or a, a suitable place for evacuation, whether that be the street or otherwise. Um, but I'd be interested to find out from FISA directly as to what our obligations in or what the land, how the land use relates to uh, the evacuation plan. Yes, Sri Mekol, we'll we'll go back and um, provide you with the full background of the city's involvement in that evacuation plan, as well as um, FISA's views on um, access to that reserve um, and other options for access. Um, if, if we have time for that, otherwise it'll be a matter of what the process would be and what FISA's requirements would be. Councillor Konchevsky. Um, just in relation to um, the mature trees, um, I think there's five large trees that were referenced, but there's probably, I think, maybe two on the site that are um, quite lovely specimens. And I was just wondering um, what options would be open to the city in relation to caveats around um, tree removal um, and... Um, approval or engagement with council in relation to that in future. Through you, Michael, we could impose a requirement that the trees are, um, re remain there as part of the contract of sale, so it could be through a caveat or just a condition on the contract of sale. Um, a note in one of the comments, it ra raises, uh, one of the submissions raises an issue relating to paving in the adjacent area and just wondering whether that has been forwarded to the relevant director for review or action. And if we could just get some comments in the briefing notes on that. Through you, Mayor Cole, can I just ask, does that relate to paving just outside the Rosewood Aged Care building? I can't recall. It was yeah, paving in the public realm um, and one of the comments, it was a comment around um, that, uh, that, there we go, yes, that had, had been previously asked to be addressed and we that the city had not managed to take care of that and were then doing this. And so it was, it was not related to the um, actual land swap. It was more just, I just wondered whether um, that the, Consultation had raised an, an, a, an a, um, I guess, a customer service issue, and whether that could be a, I will find the words, but if that could be forwarded on for consideration around, um, I guess, paving renewal. Um, and the other thing was in relation to the um, playground. Um, my observation on site and from the feature survey that appears, uh, it would appear that the boundary is running through or. Um, the actual playground at this point in time and what has been discussed with um, the um, well, the um, Sisters of Mercy in relation to their playground um, now and in the future. Through you, Mayor Cole, the feature survey shows that the old playground will basically abut the boundary between the school and the city's land if the land exchange goes ahead. Um, so that means, so we've spoken to the school about that and they're looking into whether the old playground, which is the one that the fence would be adjacent to, um, would, could be removed and replaced. So the newer playground which the city installed, that's away from the boundaries, so that won't be impacted. Um, but the school would be looking into whether the old playground, they'd need to move some portions. But basically it's only, it will be abutting um, the old playground, it's not actually going to be like going through the middle of it. I just note there's a reference in the feature survey that says metal climbing rail encroaching into lot 821. Um, but I guess also just it would be perhaps useful to clarify that on site um, as the two playgrounds may be old and new but present as one really when you're there. Um, and the other thing was that a note from the, the correspondence, uh, the, the, um, the item that um, the costs are not going to be borne by the city and wondered whether that should be or could be reflected in the recommendation um, so that it's not just part of the, um, uh, the general commentary um, and whether that would be possible to put some wording in relating to that. 
Through you, Michael, yes, we can include that as a um, part of the recommendation. Oh, and just in relation to um, Ms. Vrooman's commentary around um, the um, residents of Rosewood being able to access a um, a walking route, I guess, from the um, around as to whether there um, it would be possible to, um, it, I guess, it, whether there is anything preventing Rosewood and the city, or well, the Rosewood from engaging in conversation with the city around putting an access or egress point into the um, section of the reserve so that that walking route could potentially be maintained. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, it's possible for Rosewood to have gates to access the pocket park and um, a gate into the current Brentham Street Reserve area. Um, they're also, we might be looking at whether there's money on budget to actually have some paved paths within the reserve as well. Thank you, that's great. Um, just um, to the Manager of Governments, just in, in relation to the paved paths that we're looking at, um, Effectively, this sort of becomes two quite distinct parcels of public open space. So, are the paths going to go through the Brentham Street Reserve towards Leederville, or are you talking about having paths within what would then be the, we're calling it a pocket park, but it would have the additional 539 square metres where the music house currently is? Where would the paths be located? Cal oh, yes, Director of Infrastructure and Environment. Yeah, through you, Michael. Currently on next year's budget sits an amount for paths in Brentham Street Reserve. The final locations of those paths have not been decided. There was a community budget submission about putting some of these paths in and our response to that was depending on the land swap, if it goes ahead and what that specific nature, we would then decide on the location of the paths. So as, as currently in the draft budget there is money to put some paths in and, and that's uh, open for discussion. And could we get some advice from administration about leaving um, pathway access between Rosewood and the um, and the park that would be um, effectively connected through Bentham Street um, just in relation to the existing maintaining the existing access and there'd have to be another um, around the corner so that you could get through to the park and whether the whether that's something that administration could provide advice on in terms of talking to Sisters of Mercy about that, paving it, and then having permeable fencing on both sides so that there's no dark spots around the primary school. If we could at least get some feedback from Sisters of Mercy on that point, and the school, community perhaps. Um, yeah, and also if you, could, if you could approach Rosewood directly to talk to them about whether they would be interested in having direct access to the park from the west side of Rosewood directly into the park. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we can do that prior to the meeting. Thank you. Councillor Toppelberg. So just a further point to that. I think um, so effectively what we're asking is whether the school support of the land swap is contingent upon uh, there being uh, no, or, well, the fence abutting Rosewood, or whether or not they would, uh, there would be an appetite to allow uh, some L-shaped uh, access to, to maintain <laughs> that path. I think that that would need to be resolved together with the fencing issue, and my guess is that that means that we'd need to have the Sisters of Mercy and Rosewood and the city sitting together. I'm not sure whether that would be able to be achieved between now and next Tuesday, but if I'm hearing the question right, or the, in order to make a, an assessment of that, I think the yeah. feedback we would need would would have to be from the two organisations and then our assessment of it in terms of agreeing on the fencing uh, because I, if in principle support is given to say a one and a half metre access way but we're going to end up with a 1.8 metre high solid fence on each side it poses other issues in terms of our responsibility so I think we need to try and clarify that with the three parties between now and Friday preferably. <laughs> Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, Sisters of Mercy have advised that they would want uh, permeable fencing, that, which is the same as Rosewood Aged Care currently has around them. So it's like that black um, post, yes. Um, Sisters of Mercy are based over east, but they have said they can come over if required. So we can look at arranging a meeting with Rosewood um, and Laval Legal and Sisters of Mercy, um, if that assists. 
And just a further question then perhaps to the CEO, given our non-requirement to advertise uh, any of this. Um, if that change was proposed, given the feedback that we've had, uh, let's say that we were to get that response, if, if the council was of a mind to change uh, the proposed land swaps, I assume it would change the square meterage potentially and also the design and layout. Is that something that would, in your opinion, need to go back out for consultation, given, uh, well, the school community obviously wouldn't have had a chance to see that if it changes between now and next Tuesday either? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we would have to take advice from the Sisters of Mercy on their acceptability of that, given that it's currently done by agreement, um, and we can take on notice whether or not, uh, if this decision was made, it would be in response to the public consultation and submissions. Um, we'll get advice for council meeting next Tuesday on whether or not that would trigger re-advertising. Um, just to note, Mayor Cole, on top of that, we still have quite a long, complex uh, legal process to go through to amend the scheme to allow this to go through. So there's a, another round of public consultation for the scheme amendment and that goes to the Planning Commission if approved by the Council and then um, for decision by the Minister for Planning as well. So there's still um, further opportunity for public consultation on, on the general proposal. Thank you. Thank you. And just to be clear, I'm just seeking advice. I don't have any position on whether we should have an access way there or not. It's just about getting advice and um, seeing what the views of the interested parties are. Councillor Harley. Thank you. Um, Mayor, I'm just a uh, question through to um, Maluka. It was a, a statement that was made a little while ago back in this debate, so I'm hoping that you'll be able to remember what was said. I just want to clarify and it was to do with the driver behind this land swap. And um, Maluka, if you could just clarify, um, you mentioned about clarifying fences, you know, the the, um, board, the boundaries and clarifying things like liability. Are you able to go back over that answer, please, to just clarify for me what the driver was of this land swap, because that's not my memory. So I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, so the school has come to us previously. They lease a portion of Brentham Street Reserve at the moment, um, and they did come to us uh, uh, raising queries about whether they could purchase that portion of land. So I think that would have been at least five years ago. So that um, was when this really started, and since then we've been looking at how we can formalise ownership of the land to align with its current use. Um, thank you. Through you, um, Chair, that's not quite as I remember what you said, but just for the um, just for the record, actually, it goes back longer than five years. It goes back closer to 12 years. But um, I'll go. I wouldn't mind going back over um, the transcript of this or the recording of that. I just want to understand for the public record exactly what the driver was, because the the fences, just for the public record, the fences and that have all come after and they've been added on um, um, over the years. So. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, I'll come back to that during the week. Um, I just have a um, question, and it may be in the report, and I'm missing it. But um, do we have, for the record, the dollar value of each of the parcels of land from a valuation perspective? Through you, Mayor Cole. I think that was provided in the um, report that went to council in December. So I'll make sure I can provide you that information in the briefing notes. Okay, so you don't have it on the um, for now. Okay, that's unfortunate. Okay, so my question related to the valuation of the land and whether the valuation of the land uh, for the parcel which um, the city will be taking over, which is the essentially the the back of the school um, into the um, into the Brentham Reserve. Um, and the land swap that we're doing, which is street frontage. So I just want to, I guess, for the clarification of valuation, understand um, whether there's a difference between land that um, is unlikely or will not be um, developed, given it's kind of in the middle of a park, versus land that may be able to be um, developed. And I understand there's, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other and that in terms of the land, but I'd like to get an understanding of whether that valuation is just a straight out land valuation. So um, the sooner you could provide that, um, hopefully by tomorrow, the, the better, because I've got some questions in regards to that. Um, so the other um, question I had is in regards to the music house and what the arrangements are for the demolition of the music house. <laughs> 
through you, Meko, um, we're requiring that if the land exchange proceeded that we would be provided lot 37 as vacant land. So it would be up to the school to arrange the demolition at their cost prior to the land being exchanged. So that would be a condition of the contract. Um, and I think my last my last question was um, so my second last question um, is in regards to the parcel of land which is lot 39 which will go from um, public I think it's designated as public open space at the moment and will go um, to public purpose primary school can you just clarify whether that land will now be able to be developed by the school for the purpose of construction of other school buildings. Through you, Mayor Cole, can I just clarify, do you mean lot 39, which is currently that's owned by the school, or do you mean lot 37? Um, so um, lot this thir map, lot, 30, lot 39, uh, sorry, lot, um, lot, this is tiny, um, the yellow section next to lot 39, I beg your pardon, the part that is currently owned by the city and is going to be swapped to Brentham. Yeah. Um, the proposal is that that would be public purpose primary school, so it wouldn't be able to be developed, or it would have to be developed in a, um, consistent with that reservation. So my final question is if they are, if that land is able to be developed, are there any then restrictions that would exist for the city in the land that is next to that, sorry my eyes are not so good, which then becomes lot 38 and where the music school is now, would a school building, are there any restrictions then likely to arise for the city in having the option to sell and or develop that land themselves next to a school building? I just want to understand what the restrictions may be in building next to a school. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. So that land is currently reserved for public open space. There's not, it's not proposed to change. Um, so the city would be restricted to develop it as public open space only unless the city decided to change the reservation of that land and zone it something else which would need to go through a scheme amendment process. Um, but the adjoining zoning wouldn't have, wouldn't impose as um, public purpose primary school, wouldn't have any restriction on our ability to do that. So there wouldn't be any difference between the current situation and uh, the proposed situation under this report. Um, Councillor Harling, the CEO has um, a response to your question earlier. Thanks, through you, Mayor Cole. Councillor Harling, you asked about the market valuation of the land and uh, I found the reference from the December uh, Council agenda, which is page 540 of the uh, 11 December 2018 Council meeting. Uh, the city did obtain a market valuation based on the square metre value used in the calculations of $300 per square metre. It was estimated that the value of the uh, 2,300 square metres of land proposed for disposal by the city is $690,000. And uh, given that there was going to be an equal um, proportion of land exchanged, um, our uh, recommendation was that no funds, um, no exchange of funds would be required. And thank you, CEO, and through your chair. So just to clarify, so that's straight out $300 per square metre. So there's no additional value put on the fact that land that is being exchanged is street frontage land adjacent to the school. So there's no, no extra value from a valuation perspective. It's just straight out square, square metre. Yep. OK, thank you. Councillors, any further questions? Um, I was just going to ask the Manager of Governance, I think it would be quite useful to have another um, attachment that shows the areas of land that are currently owned by the city but which are being used and fenced by the school, just so that we can actually have a very clear visual representation of how that land is currently being used and fenced um, and where that is owned by the city, including, so for example, the car park school car park which is currently owned by the City of Vincent. Through you, Michael, yes, we can provide that um, before the council meeting. 
Thank you. And just in relation to the issue of the mature trees on site that would be potentially part of the land swap going to the Sisters of Mercy, the issue of a caveat was discussed, which is probably the stronger mechanism, but would you also raise the issue of the trees of significance um, register with the, with the Sisters of Mercy to see whether they'd be amenable to that? Through you, Mac, I'll, I'll discuss with the Director Infrastructure and Environment what would be most, or Development Services, to see what would be suitable. Thank you, Manager. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, the next item that was raised by a member of the Public Gallery was item 5.1, which is 147 to 149 Brisbane Street, Perth, proposed change of use from office to multiple dwellings and unlisted use short stay accommodation. Questions on this item? No. Um, Director of Development Services, thank you for attending a site visit with myself and Councillor Gondoshevsky and Councillor Toppelberg today. Um, the issue of uh, looking at this application in terms of short-term accommodation came up and what differences there would be in the assessment and also um, I think there was the issue raised around reconfiguration of the internal layout where it does appear to be sort of corridors and dark and, and not really having access to light. Could you <coughs> potentially just address some of those issues particularly in relation to looking at this as short-term accommodation as opposed to residential? Certainly. Um, through you Mayor Cole, the the new design WA um, up the new part of the R codes that has been created through design WA uh, will come into effect at the end of uh, this week. So um, any decision made by council next week on this application and other applications um, will need to be assessed against those provisions. Those provisions um, apply to residential development, but they won't they won't apply to a short term accommodation. So a, a short term dwelling proposal. Um, most of the concerns and the reasons for refusal that administration has set out in the recommendation relate to the impact um, and the amenity impact um, that the design and the development would have on the residents. Um, so they're all still, they would all still be relevant issues to consider as part of a short-term accommodation proposal, um, but the R codes themselves wouldn't apply in the form um, that they have been applied to this proposal if, if it became all short-term accommodation. Um, in relation to uh, the internal layout and the design, the, the current proposal um, is to leave all the existing walls and um, the kitchenette and um, the infrastructure, the toilets, that are currently in those offices exactly as they are and to try and use that existing configuration um, for a residential dwelling. Um, that creates a lot of issues f in relation to amenity, so ch changes to that internal layout um, would benefit, potentially would have a very significant benefit on the amenity of those, of those spaces. Um, I'm not sure though whether that would be enough to address <laughs> the issues for a long-term long permanent um, residential apartment because there's still the issue around communal open space, the lack of, there's still the issue around the lack of landscaping because there's, there's no landscaping, um, there's still no universal access so you, you would have to be able to walk up steps to get to those apartments um, among other things but it would make a difference to the access to light and ventilation into those apartments so it would be of benefit and potentially um, a short stay accommodation use could be appropriate with some internal changes. Hopefully that summarises or not. Thank you, Director. Any other questions on this application? Okay, thank you. The third item raised this evening from the Public Gallery was item 7.7, .7, Public Open Space Proposal for Sydney and Haines Street Site, North Perth. Questions? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. A few questions. Just for clarity, there are three lots that are on the site. Can we just, and I know that it's in the report, but I understand from Mr. Reid's submission that there's some 
conjecture as, as in relation to the deed of trust and the caveat that exists. Can we just get clarity to, as to exactly which lots the uh, deed of trust relates to, please? Through you, Mayor Cole, it's lot nine that the deed of trust encumbers, so that's uh, the lot that comprises um, Kids Galore's childcare centre at the moment. So uh, what about lot 100? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's not encumbered by the deed of trust. Okay, um, and then I guess the the essence of the submission that was made um, during the in the de during the deputation or, uh, by Mr. Reid uh, probably primarily relates to uh, the officer recommendation uh, part 6.2, which effectively says we'll have a look at it, but we make no promises about it, and effectively they're looking for us to at least provide some. Uh, level of support. There's also was some discussion about a potential differing of legal opinion, and obviously, um, with kids galore not being privy to it, to our legal advice, uh, we don't know what they know, and they don't know what we know. So it's a bit difficult to make comment on it. But uh, can we perhaps seek some clarity between now and Friday before the briefing notes are issued in relation to what uh, um, I'm assuming from the comments that kids galore are prepared to share their legal advice. I know this has been going on since. Uh, late 2016, but just to get some clarity um, and in relation to some of the other, uh, I can't remember the numbers, but those seven lots where the, uh, the deed of trust had been lifted um, and in relation to what process was followed and whether uh, that process was actually the correct process uh, to follow for the, 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 use, the other uses that have emerged on lands that were subject to that original, uh, the, the original bequeathment of the land. Is that possible but by Friday? I'm not sure that it is, but is it possible to at least attempt that before Friday? Through you, Mayor Cole, we can have a look and see if we can provide details um, Yeah, in the briefing notes. Okay, and just for clarity, because my esteemed colleague next to me asked me earlier, and so I'll ask it on her behalf. Um, the proposal, uh, the recommendation as proposed effectively says that by 2021 we'll have a uh, development plan, but nothing would happen prior to June uh, or prior to the financial year of 2022. So effectively, whatever plan is, uh, whatever plan the city is, intends to, uh, to arrive at or to, to complete uh, would sit dormant for 12 months. Is that the intent? Or is that detailed design work or otherwise that would happen in between? What, what happens between June 30, 2021 and June 30, 2022? Through you, Mayor Cole, my understanding is that the um, recommendations from the development plan would need to be budgeted for, so that's why we've allowed like additional time for that to occur. Um, I'm not sure we can provide more information in the briefing notes if necessary. Okay, thank you. And just uh, if we could also get some comments in the briefing notes uh, in relation to, um, I, I know some of it is contained in the, in the POS strategy, but about the the viability of uh, of a public open space at the size that uh, would be proposed without um, without the removal of the deed of trust or with, if, the, if the whole portion of the land was used and what the, uh, I suppose, a, a reasonable cost of providing that as public open space and the amenity uh, that would be expected in that park and also similarly with uh, Kids Galore's existing proposal. Through you, Mayor Cole, we can provide um, cost estimates for converting the whole site and then also just lot nine to public open space. Is that what you're requesting? Well, Kids Galore's proposal, uh, whilst effectively, uh, as was shown in this slide, whilst effectively there is uh, 1,571 metres to remain with the city, just that they're looking at the reclaiming of some of the road reserve and otherwise, so effectively ending up with around 3,000 square metres, which is about half what it would otherwise be if the whole site was converted if we can just get it some indication of the costs including the road reserve uh, side of things etc and uh, a, a desktop valuation on uh, on the land it's part of kids galore's proposal to purchase as well that would be helpful thank you um council top of just to follow up on that are you asking what the cost would be to convert the road reserve into public open space <laughs> Uh, I guess what I'm trying to seek clarity on is, at the moment, the whole project is unbudgeted. Uh, if we were to f go down the path Kids Galore has asked us to go down, what would that cost the city? 
potentially and what would be the benefit to the city in terms of the land sale and if we were to not go down that path uh, the kids galore has asked but look at the entire space is public open space what's the potential cost to the city I don't know they're going to be very broad numbers um, and I will just comment as well I'm not sure where people are buying land in Leaderville at $300 a square metre but perhaps if we can get a real valuation on the cost and the value of the land in North Perth that would be great thank you um, well, just to follow up on that, I'm very interested to find out an estimate of the cost of converting the road reserve, because that's talked about in terms of reclaiming um, um, 1,879 metres of the adjacent road reserve. Um, we know usually when we do road works, there is sometimes significant or unforeseen costs, particularly if service like relocation um, is involved. So I think we do need to have a bit of an estimate, just at least, on that. Um, and also interested, I think I'm asking similar to what you are asking, Councillor Toppleberg, in terms of the different facility options. This is a question for the Director of um, Community and Business. Um, the different facility options based on the different size of park that would be with the land sale, with the whole lot just as is, and with the lot with the um, with the road. Um, way uh, added in. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we can certainly do that. It, it is important to note that uh, the using the public open space strategy levels of service, um, regardless, this would be regarded as local open space, and we deliberately did reduce, um, I guess, the the optimal size or the preferred size of local open space all the way back down to zero hectares, and we did that deliberately because we did know that when we were looking to acquire land, um, there may be occasions where land less than um, 0.3 of a hectare, which would be preferable, may not be achievable. So you will note there's um, two measurements in the public open space strategy, the preference for local open space not to be less than 0.3 of a hectare, but our levels of service then start at zero hectares, um, contemplating this type of situation. So we can certainly provide, I guess, an assessment of the level of amenity differences between the, the two um, possible outcomes. Councillors, Councillor Konchewski. Just one more. Um, through you to the Director of Community and Business. Um, the production of a development plan, just if I could get some comment on the resources associated with that in terms of what might be the time frame that would be um, uh, required if the city was to commence that work on 1 July 2020 um, as to when that, that sort of a document or consideration might be able to be delivered. Uh, through Mayor Cole, I would anticipate that a development plan would fundamentally be completed by an external consultant with direction from administration. So um, I hazard a guess, but I, I would have thought this is a fairly small site and while there's um, some, some land tenure and potentially use of road reserves that might complicate the plan, I, I couldn't really see this being more than a, a six month exercise at, at most um, with most of the resource effort being contract management and direction to the consultant. All the, the technical work would be done externally. Um, could I also just request that under in the report where it talks about consultation advertising it talks about who has been consulted to date, but it doesn't talk about how consultation with the community would occur under the proposed approach of having a development plan. So I think that information is would be useful for any community members reading this report. Thank you. We'll add that in the briefing uh, into the report. Thank you. Councillor Castle. Through you, Michael. Um It's a follow-up question to one asked by Councillor Toppleberg earlier in relation to the legal advice. Um, without re revealing the contents of that, that advice was given in 2016 when we didn't have some of the context that we have now, in particular in relation to the public open space strategy. So I'm just I'm looking for some clarification whether we have the ability and the time to seek further advice given that we could now add some more context to that um, decision about whether the caveat could be removed um, and 
uh, similarly to as Councillor mm -hmm. Toppelberg asked, understanding better why we seem to have conflicting legal advice to kids galore and, and what that actually means in the context of our public open space strategy. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we can look at whether we can get further legal advice, but it's unlikely we'll be able to get that within a week. Um, the legal advice basically sets out the process for excising Lot 9 from the Deed of Trust, and it just shows that it's a very lengthy process and also quite expensive for the city. So essentially it says you have to show why this portion of land... Can I just land... comment, because we do have a confidential attachment with the legal advice, so if, if council members want to have a a deep discussion about the legal advice and there also is legal advice for um, another matter audit committee we can actually have a, a confidential discussion at the end of the meeting if if that is if that is desired so I just wanted to flag that that we can we can actually go into confidential session and talk about that advice in much more detail if we wanted to go to the actual um, content of that advice just flagging Through you, Mayor Colt, that probably would assist. Um. So I could flag that for discussion in a confidential session? Thank you, that would be great. Okay, we'll do that. Are there any further questions in relation to this item? Yes, I have one Harley. question, just um, wanting to understand, and perhaps I'm not sure who can answer this. Um, and I was kind of half joking when I was going to offer to buy the car park at the same lot that Aramore. College Lands Hop is happening, but I would like to understand what, I get that it's North Perth and I get that it's Leadville, I want to understand what the difference is per square meterage of land valuation. I'd like to have an understanding and insight, did we use a different agent, is it to do with the way the land's zoned, etc. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, it's based on the zoning of the land, so in this case I think it's uh, residential R20, although... I'll have to check that, but basically it's based on what the reservation is. So with Aaron Moore, with the land exchange, the zoning is public open sp or parks and recreation, public open space and public open space primary school. So the value has based it on the highest and best use of the land based on its current reservation. So that's why the differences are. It's really the zoning of the land. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, thank you. We'll come back to this item to discuss the legal advice later. Um, I've had a request to deal next with item um, 9.1 because we have Anita Marriott joining us um, this evening to answer questions. Um, so we'll go to that. 9.1 Draft Sustainable Environment Strategy. Questions please. Councillor Loden. Thank you, Chair. Um, I ask for my fellow councillors' forbearance here. Um, we've had a few uh, emails back and forth over the last couple of weeks, and I still have a few questions to ask on this. Um, the first one was uh, around the Switch Your Thinking program, which, to my understanding, is the primary way that we're supporting our residents to uptake solar in the community, and which it offers quite a significant discount. I was wondering if we knew. Um, what the uptake was by residents on that and secondly how are we proposing to promote that program going forward as part of the SES? Through you Mayor Cole, um, the first part of that question I'm going to have to take that question on notice and, and actually um, inquire with us what you're thinking program as to the numbers. Um, the second part of the question in relation to how we're promoting that um, program to the community. Uh, we have been using um, the city's um, e-newsletter and social media primarily, uh, as well as uh, the free workshops that the Switch Your Thinking program uh, delivers to our community, including the solar um, and battery storage workshops we've been doing and, and the associated promotion in, in local newspapers. Um, but we acknowledge that uh, perhaps that could be uh, done um, 
uh, perhaps in a more widespread or effective manner, that promotion. Um, and we have um, already put in train uh, some measures to get that uh, promotion increase to things like the, um, the eco signs that are being installed around the city, uh, as well as um, perhaps looking at some uh, temporary uh, pull-up type banners at um, high use facilities like the library and Beattie Park and perhaps all sorts of events. So we're talking to the marketing team about those now. Um, the second one is around uh, the notice of motion on action on climate change from last year on the 4th of April. Um, that notice of motion stated, uh, requested administration to set a target of zero net carbon emissions by a defined date for um, the whole of the city's emissions. I wasn't able to find that in the report and I was just wondering if you could provide some comment on that please. Through you, Nicole. Um, thank you, Councillor Lurden. Um, th that is um, probably an oversight on, on, on my part personally in, in the way that um, the um, sustainable environment strategy was prepared. Um, you will have noted that we've addressed um, carbon emissions associated with the three key opportunity areas being energy, transport and waste separately, but we haven't actually um, anywhere made a statement about um, a, a, net, a net zero um, carbon emission target for those three areas. So that is something that we are able to uh, retrofit fairly easily into the draft strategy. Um, I've been having a look at um, the best way to do that and perhaps that is to provide a separate statement um, prior to the first key opportunity area um, being discussed. So just ahead of energy we can make a, a statement about the overall um, net carbon emission target um, and we're at the moment proposing to make that the same target date as we have for energy uh, which we've made at, um, at 2050 in, in line with the IPCC recommendation. Thank you. Uh, third one is around um, our waste emissions. So we've, as part of our waste strategy, which sits underneath this, um, we have a target of zero waste of landfill by 2028, which will obviously reduce <laughs> the amount of CO2 we produce and the resulting residual will be from our, um, our management of those organic materials. Um, how do we, what, how do we consider those carbon emissions when we're selecting which uh, organic management strategy. How is that considered as part of the waste strategy? Through you, Nicole. Uh, so the details of that are yet to be worked out through the implementation of the waste strategy. So um, projects one and five, if I remember correctly, of the waste strategy are going to be looking at dealing with, with the organic components of waste. Um, uh, as far as I understand at the moment, the best option available to us for dealing with organic waste is organic compost, so aerobic composting, uh, which uh, would reduce the carbon emissions from that organic material by 90%. So we'd be looking at reducing our current emissions um, from organic waste being around 2,000 tonnes per year down to around uh, 200 tonnes per year um, through getting our, our, our waste landfill down to zero, uh, which at the moment we'd be looking at needing to offset through um, uh, the purchasing of carbon credits. However, it is possible that by the time we get to that zero landfill, fill target, there may be new uh, technology options available for composting that might reduce those emissions further in a direct manner. Will the waste strategy consider alternative um, strategies other than aerobic composting for the management as part of these two, under these two, um, are they strategies or plans or? Sure. Through you, Nicole. Um, so I think that's something that council would determine, wouldn't it, being council later? We've got an existing waste strategy, uh, but I ha it, to my understanding, the waste strategy states out that we will look at FOGO, for example. I'm unclear if that FOGO assessment, when it looks at pulling out the organics, will actually con consider different options for organics as documented in the waste strategy, or if that's something separate. Through you, Michael, if I can add something, uh, as I'm responsible for the waste strategy and I'm sitting next to Anita, so I'll do my best. Um, the waste strategy does say that um, one of the approaches we'll use in every decision we make is to consider carbon emissions. So that's sort of implicit in every decision we make. In terms of sort of things like composting and those specific decisions, I think in reality it'll depend on what's available on the market at the time. And remember, we are trying to 
achieve zero carbon emissions over quite a long period of time. So what's available now may be different to what's available. So we might enter a five-year contract for treatment of our FOGO, which you know could be a certain type of composting, which could change in five years. So I suppose the key, que the que the key part of the answer I'm trying to say is that um, carbon emissions will be considered in the decision we make. So Council will have a, an input into those. And if there's more than one technology available, it won't be just price. It'll be carbon emissions that will be considered too. <coughs> Um, did the city investigate the purchase of offsets for our, given we have roughly 8,000 tonnes of CO2, it's not a huge annual amount, uh, purchase of offsets for that, either at this point in time or in the future, and do you have any idea on the costs that that would be on an annual basis? Mm. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, so we have had a look at uh, what it would cost to potentially offset our current and future carbon emissions. So um, our total uh, car operational carbon emissions as of the baseline year of 2017-18 um, are just over 8,300 tonnes per annum. Uh, we are estimating that at the moment we might be paying around $8 per tonne to offset that carbon. That's um, based on other local governments and what were they currently paying, um, which would come to around $67,000 per year for our total carbon emissions as of baseline year. Um, looking at the, the targets and the trajectory we've got set out in the draft waste, uh, sorry, draft um, sustainable environment strategy, um, uh, we are predicting that our total carbon emissions will reduce by um, the end of this um, uh, strategies term, it being in 2023-2024, um, they'll have reduced to just over 6,000 tonnes, which will reduce the annual cost of carbon off offsets at the current price to just under $50,000. Um, and continuing that tra trajectory out to 2029-2030, um, we're looking at uh, roughly half the carbon emissions we currently have. So that would, um, again, roughly half the cost um, per annum of, of offsetting those carbon emissions down to around $34,000. Um, so I guess the, the question that arises, um, I guess, is really a matter of debate for Council around how soon do we want to start uh, putting funds into offsetting uh, those carbon emissions versus perhaps um, uh, preserving those funds for, for other, other expenditure. Do you have an idea of uh, how many Councils around Australia are currently um, offsetting their emissions or, or, or of Councils that are? Uh, through you, Nicole. Um, so at the moment, the only um, other local government in the Perth metro area that we're aware of is the City of Fremantle, which is a well-known example. They have been offsetting their um, their carbon emissions for a number of years, and we've used um, their their costs as an example of what might be available to us. Um, uh, other local governments are um, that we know of are in the eastern states, so we haven't come across any other local governments. It's possible that there are others um, locally that are offsetting part, but we're not aware of any that are completely carbon neutral in Perth. I just wanted to clarify, the, uh, I think you mentioned it briefly before around the IPCC recommendation for the basis of choosing uh, 2050 um, as the deadline. Now my understanding of that is that it's, um, that's intended at sort of that state and federal level, um, which includes emissions from the agricultural sector, the industry sector, fixed stationary industry um, that tend to have long investment timelines, um, given the city doesn't have any of those things, we just have waste, which is proposed to be reduced by 90% in 10 years if we meet our waste target, uh, transport, which is 9% of the total emissions, and then grid energy, um, which uh, is basically electricity coming into the, which you can use solar for, and gas, which we're proposing to reduce by 80% by 2024. Did you consider bringing that target forward that because we have a, an easier pathway to achieving that than larger entities like the state and federal government? Through you, Nicole. We, we have certainly been thinking about that and we, we certainly sought advice on a suitable 
target as part of um, the development of the strategy, and we did use external consultants for that. Um, the reason we chose to remain with the 2050 target for the moment is um, just the number of uncertainties relating uh, particularly to um, grid-based electricity and um, heavy vehicle transportation options. There are a lot of unknowns in both of those areas, both in relation to te technology but also to um, uh, policy at, at higher levels of government that may impact the, the speed at which we might be able to and the cost at which we might be able to, um, to implement those. Um, certainly in relation to our stationary energy, um, it's very unlikely that the city will be able to directly install sufficient solar to offset 100% of our operational electricity use. Um, so most likely we will still be purchasing some degree of offsets. Um, but what we don't know yet is what kind of changes um, both technological and political may, may happen that might open up um, other avenues or other um, uh, options for installing solar, perhaps not on city-owned land. Um, so th there are still developments that I guess we're waiting to see. It is well and truly possible that um, we, we could actually achieve uh, our target sooner than 2050. Um, I guess that is the, the, the baseline for discussion. Um, uh, and I guess we would like to, to, to leave the ultimate date um, up to council to consider. So if um, the, w the state government, WA state government, was to achieve zero emissions, that would, I assume, mean that the grid is completely renewable. So wouldn't that effectively mean that we don't need to do anything at all? We could just basically wait for them to do the work for us? Through you, Michael. Um, it is my understanding that the current um, WA state government target for electricity from the grid is 50% renewable by 2050. Um, so um, our our state government actually doesn't have a net zero carbon emissions um, target date, um, unlike most other state governments around the country. Um, so assuming that we're going to, as a state, continue to aim for 20% renewables in the grid by 2050, then at least 50% of the grid will still be fossil fuel based um, in our state by then. Um, one of the challenges, I guess, of influencing our community is that we can't tell them what to do, obviously, but we do have some leverage through the planning process. Um, and. I was wondering if there's going to be any specific targeted training of our planners to help them improve um, outcomes across the board in this sort of space. Uh, through you, Nicole. Um, so uh, training for our, our statutory planners um, is something that we have done um, on an intermittent basis over the years, and it's something that um, I would like to think will continue to do to keep them abreast of um, environmentally sustainable design so that they're able to um, properly inform applicants. Um, we're also um, uh, providing our statutory planners with a, I guess, a cheat sheet or a checklist that they're able to refer to themselves but also to provide to applicants um, and we're encouraging them to do that right from the very first conversation uh, long before the DA is lodged uh, to explain the importance of environmentally sustainable design and the options available available to those applicants and, and um, very much highlighting the fact that uh, engaging an ESD consultant from the earlier stage is going to be to the benefit of, of the applicant as well. So, yeah. And how would that be captured in the strategies or implementation plan? I might need to take that on notice without actually referring specifically, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain that we have got strategies within the, the, the draft strategy document and related um, actions in the implementation plan relating to that. Um, on the transport sector, obviously a small percentage of the total emissions, but um, we've got the light fleet covered, but there isn't any actions around the heavy vehicle fleet. Um, I was hoping administration could provide some clarification on that. Through you, Nicole. Um, again, I will have to double check the actions we have in relation to the heavy fleet. Um, to my recollection, uh, we have actions related to, or at least one action that states uh, that where we are looking to replace um, uh, utility or heavy vehicles, that we will um, opt for the lowest emission technology available until zero emission vehicles do become available. Um, and we have um, an indicative action um, uh, highlighted for the period 
beyond the life of this strategy, so beyond 2024, uh, to be seeking to trial um, and make use of, uh, I guess, a, um, a potential grant funding and other opportunities to um, to trial some fully electric or other zero emissions heavy vehicles. We just don't anticipate those options to be available to our city before 2024, so we have put them out for a later date. I only got two left, folks. Um, with the ongoing uh, assessment of solar panels on roofs, um, one of the challenges, my understanding, we have is is the the variability of solar and not being able to move the power around. So I just want to confirm if, um, as part of those ongoing solar assessments, we'll be including consideration of battery technology as well. Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, yes, we will definitely be including consideration of, um, of battery storage and other more innovative technologies. Um, and the current version of the implementa implementation plan actually um, has that um, set out within it um, so that we will be considering, uh, we will be asking our solar consultants as part of this next feasibility study that we have planned for the coming financial year to um, definitely um, consider battery storage for the relevant sites. Um, and uh, we may, uh, perhaps not in this very next feasibility study, but the one after also be looking at um, more innovative solutions such as um, solar shade structures, for example, uh, to supply areas where we might not have the roof, but we do have the, the consumption. And last one, one of, my, uh, one of the barriers I'm aware of is that we don't have an ability to move energy around, so we might produce a surplus in one place and have a deficit elsewhere. And it's also difficult for us to then purchase, say, from local residents or businesses that have a surplus supply of renewable energy. Um, and one of the mechanisms for that is um, like a peer-to-peer -peer -to -peer trading. Um, I was wondering if that is included in the strategy through you, Michael. Uh, yes, it is actually captured in the implementation plan as an action now, or we may have several actions related to to um, that item. Uh, at the moment, there are already um, uh, um, actions in train, I guess, at the at the state government level, where um, uh, they're certainly starting to move towards enabling peer-to-peer -peer energy sharing. Um, various state government agencies are supporting the trials of peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, sharing technologies. Um, and from having conversations with those agencies, it looks like they are preparing for the required regulatory changes to make that possible. Um, so that's very encouraging, but we have also included actions in the implementation plan to further uh, advocate for, the, for that to be made available as soon as possible. Thank you for your patience. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, just to clarify, and I'm looking half at Anita and half at Councillor Loden, that uh, we can certainly um, put some language in the draft strategy um, between now and uh, the meeting next Tuesday to um, clarify that we will work towards zero net emissions subject to council uh, considering and forming a policy on potential purchasing of, of offsets if there's any gap and um, taking into account what those budget implications would be. We'll make it sound a little bit more concise than that, but um, we'll do that over the next few days. Thanks. Um, just on that though, would that bind council to a position where we're buying offsets as opposed to taking actions to reduce emissions? Uh, through you, Mayor Connor, I, um the language would be about um, working towards that long-term target uh, and then for us to do some work closer through throughout the implementation of this strategy to come back to council with a proposed policy on whether or not council wanted to uh, consider purchasing offsets and then for us to be able to provide you um, some much more um, uh, certain numbers around potential costs and implications that would be put into a, into a budgeting process. Can I then ask that given that a lot of the actions in the strategy will reduce our emissions over time, it would be good to have um, a sort of time frame of offset costs and you know how they're then impacted. I know it's a bit of a guessing game, but obviously as the actions are implemented, the offset costs will come down. So if it could, that could be factored into the discussion, I think that would be useful. Any questions on the environmental strategy? Um, I just had some, I'll probably repeat myself a bit tonight, but just in terms of page three, 
Um, I just, I like that, I really like that there's a diagram that shows how the strategy sits. But I think that it could possibly be tweaked a little bit because I think it would be really good to make it clear that there's a waste, that we do have a waste strategy. And my understanding is, is that the waste strategy um, is a sort of equal document in standing in that it's a strategy. So in terms of the little strategy documents picked out there, it would probably, or would it be possible to have environmental strategy, environment, sustainable environment strategy, waste strategy, other city strategies, and then I think that where does the greening plan sit? Is Does the greening plan sit underneath and feed into the environment strategy? Um, through my cat, to me, Nicole. Um, yes, you are correct. The greening plan actually does sit under the sustainable environment strategy, so we, we can amend that diagram. So it would be great then to sort of, I think, highlight there's the sustainable environment strategy which sits alongside the waste strategy mm -hmm. um, and, the, the, and then a third tier down that shows any informing plans or documents that feed into to this strategy so that when people are reading this, while this has a section on waste, it should be very obvious to the reader that there's a standalone waste strategy with further information and, and maybe that even could potentially be considered to have that added in under the waste section that, that to you know that there is the waste strategy and <laughs> provide that kind of link back through to that. Through you Nicole that, that's definitely possible yep. Yeah. Thank you and the other question I had is just around the implementation on page Page 31, and, oh sorry, not implementation, that's all handled very well. It's the evaluation. I just wondered whether, mm -hmm. and this is probably a general question in terms of our strategies, we probably should have some kind of um, reporting time frame within our strategy documents for reporting back to council, for example, on progress mm -hmm. under strategies that are either five or ten years. So I'm just wondering if for this strategy and for others, just generally, whether we could actually have some kind of reporting time frames um, where we have documents that are five, ten years in length. So just um, because everything else, you know, there's the implementation with the actions, etc. But at what point is there sort of like a formal, is there a formal evaluation every 12 months at the midway point, etc. And what does that look like? Is it just a report up to council, etc. So perhaps um, just generally with our strategies that could be considered. Through you, Nicole. Um, yep, we can definitely look at that. At the moment, um, the statement that we've made um, either I'm not sure if it's in the dry strategy or the implementation plan, possibly both. We have said that um, we will be reporting through the city's annual um, annual report um, on, on our progress in relation to um, our performance in those various key opportunity areas. Um, but yes, we can certainly look at that further. Yep. Yeah. Um, and look, I looked at it and at first I thought this is a very lengthy document, but it's very detailed and it's very well constructed and I think... Um, there's nothing here that I would take out, but I just my first impression was this is a lengthy document. How will community members kind of engage with this if it's a brief stepping in and engaging? So um, <clears throat> I think that it's probably just by looking at those tables up front, but um, in terms of length, it is probably a lot longer than some of our other documents, and I think that the detail and the content is there, so it's not a criticism at all. Um, so I'm not advocating that it's shortened at all. I just, I just thought I'd comment that it is quite a lengthy document, but I think it's because it's got a lot of content and good content attached to it. Any other questions? Okay, moving on then. Thank you, Anita. Um, yes, the CEO has a... A disclosure of impartiality interest to read out. Thank you, Mayor Cole. I missed my opportunity. I did receive a declaration of impartiality from Councillor Murphy, who's actually just left the room. It's in relation to Artem 5.1. Councillor Murphy declared that Bianca Sandri is a member of the town team movement, of which Councillor Murphy is the chair and a part time worker. Thank you. Um, okay, so we'll just go through sequentially now for the rest of the items. So item 5.2, 4 to 10 Cow Street and 199 to 241 Fitzgerald Street, West Perth, local development plan. Councillor Loden. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm aware it's explained in words in the um, briefing about the wetlands trail map, how we na navigate around that. I can't visualise it. I was hoping that we could have some kind of map that just sort of shows how that wetland route will now work without that uh, that piece of utilising the, the water corp um, land. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, um, we certainly can provide a, a plan in the briefing notes or the council report that, or both, that shows where it currently sits. Um, it sits in that location, uh, running along Law Learn, uh, Fitzgerald, because we don't own the water corp um, easement and we can't plant anything on top of it um, because of the infrastructure that sits underneath it. But we can show exactly where it currently sits um, and obviously the applicant uh, for this LDP has proposed to provide significant landscaping and canopy to support and basically add to that uh, green link. So. Councillor Loden, any further questions? Councillors, Councillor Hallett. Um, through the Mayor to the Director of Development Services. Um, just a bit in relation to that, I know this is, maybe it'll come up in the um, actual development plan at, uh, in the future, but in terms of the Greenway um, intersection um, and the landscaping proposed, how that fits in with the, I guess, proposed envelope of the, the bulk of the premises, um, is the admin's, I guess, um, sense that the the species and things that are required to be aligned to the greenway um, will actually fit with the um, that kind of envelope and um, over any overshadowing um, affecting growth. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, the envelope of the built form itself will be very different to um, the current setbacks and height deemed to comply standards that are shown in the LDP and are shown in the um, explanatory documentation. So the actual setbacks at the upper floors, even the ground floors will be different to what's currently shown. Um, there will be there will be setbacks which are already shown in here to the water corp easement, etc., which will allow planting in ground. Um, but given the nature of uh, the site and its current provisions under the built form policy, which allow for nil setbacks in most um, locations currently, the a lot of the planting will occur on the balconies, um, fronting Fitzgerald Street, fronting the water corp easement and uh, to the rear fronting the um, the car park as well as um, on the on the roof. So I think there's no doubt that given the nature of the site being on a transit corridor and the current built form policy provisions that allow nil setbacks almost everywhere, that the majority of the planting will occur on the upper floors. Um, and they'll need to provide that in order to meet the standards that we have in our policies as well as the new standards that have come out in Design WA, so there'll be no escaping that. Um, but they have provided some extra setbacks along the, um, the easement, which will allow in-ground planting, um, which will definitely support Fitzgerald Street um, and that connection through. Um, and they're also proposing to have um, pots with significant um, trees with canopy as much as you can get out of a, a large pot sitting on top of the water corp easement. Can I ask a follow-up question? How will they satisfy the deep soil zone requirements of the um, design WA if it's going to be, you know, I mean, I understand there's the 1.5 metre setback from the easement. It's not a lot of space to grow a tree, particularly if it's active, active frontages. Um, are we actually setting this up to you know, provides pretty much minimal in-ground at-grade planting. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. The, the applicant will have the opportunity through the built form policy um, and through Design WA to provide on structure planting <coughs> over and above what would be required on ground to compensate for that if they choose not to have setbacks um, to the rear or setbacks, to, well, we, we, I don't think we'd want to see setbacks to Fitzgerald Street along the entire frontage, but there's opportunities there for them to do that. Um, the, as I said, the current built form policy provisions allow nil setbacks um, generally, so um, I don't think that the LDP is setting ourselves up to have no in-ground planting. Um, it's 
setting a framework that would allow nil setbacks where they're appropriate um, <coughs> while ensuring that the other provisions of apartment design, the R codes and the built form policy are met in relation to landscaping, either a combination of on ground and on structure or if they can provide all on ground that certainly would be um, a better outcome. Councillor Harley. Just have a question on that because it's a little bit, it's a little bit chicken and egg. It's a <clears throat> for my um, for the answer that you've just provided through your chair. So my question is again, um, and I guess following on from the answer you've just given, if as this is presented, all the various setbacks apply, what percentage of deep soil planting will occur? So I am, I've heard your answer about on top of building. I think that's a a complete myth, but anyway, um, it's like borrowed light and you know borrowed air and all the rest of it. I just would want an understanding of how much percentage of planting is actually going to be in the ground in setbacks and other areas. Through you, Mayor Cole, the applicant hasn't put forward a development application. So I can't, I, and we don't have a design that they've drafted up because they haven't engaged an architect. Um, so we don't have uh, a deep soil um, planting proposal from the applicant. Um, I have to, I'd have to refresh my memory on what um, the R codes now require or will require from Friday um, for in-ground planting. David might remember, but it's, 20% plus, uh, sorry, 10% um, plus is 12.5 or something. Percent is what's required under the R codes, roughly. I thought Design WO was 12%, but then you could get concessions if you have mature trees. Is that right? So 12%, where are we going to get 12% on this LDP? You can offset for planting on structure. Okay. Uh, through you, Mayor so the planting on structure offsets would um, be where the site just can't physically can contain the, those, so that would be going through the performance-based assessment. I'm not sure how to put into a question my deep disappointment with that utter nonsense, but my it's just a complete <laughs> con in my view. Um, but my question is, again, about where the discussion starts. So may I just ask, in terms of the ongoing discussions with the applicant, I understand they haven't got a DA in, but I also understand the applicant is in the mood for discussion and consultation and ensuring that stakeholders um, are included in all that. So my question is then, as an administration, where does that discussion start? Does it go along the lines of uh, you won't be able to fit all your deep soil planting into because you have all your setbacks. Therefore, um, you can do the plantings here, you can do the plantings there. Or do you start with the conversation that says, this is what we would hope that you achieve. This is a significant site. Um, it is a major, a major um, development along that, along that piece of the street, obviously fronting one of our parks. Do you start with the conversation of strongly encouraging them to try and achieve deep, deep soil planting percentages without the, without the what I would term, in my personal words, the con of on structure planting. Through you, Mayor Cole, the city always starts with what the required, what the deemed to comply standard is. So, in this case, 12%. We would advise the applicant to provide 12% deep soil on ground, just because the deemed to comply setback is nil doesn't mean that the building should be boundary to boundary. Um, this happens all the time and buildings aren't built boundary to boundary. Um, most of the time there's landscaping of some form at the rear or at the street frontage or internally. So um, I can't think of any examples in the last few years where an applicant hasn't provided in ground deep soil um, our requirement currently is 15% and we get close to that almost every time. So our expectation of the applicant would be provide 12%. And if they don't provide 12%, they're going to have to have a very strong justification for why and they're going to have to demonstrate to whoever the decision maker, in this case it's likely to be the DAP, their satisfaction that um, the on 
structure planting compensates for the lack of deep soil on ground. Um, as I said, this happens all the time where the setbacks are nil and yet the applicant has to provide on ground planting. So they provide a setback in a particular location to do that. Can I just follow up on that? Because this goes to the rear setbacks. So my understanding is the rear setback, so that's where it adjoins the residential zoned area. So Cow Street and the car park at the rear. The deemed to comply standard, if I'm correct, is 4.5 metres from one to, from ground to three storeys. And um, the, the proposal is to say nil is fine as long as there's a 0.5 setback for right of way widening. So I think the question is, are we comfortable that it should be near, nil setback at the rear where we're looking at nil setback at the Fitzgerald Street side um, and we're looking at a pretty minimal setback from the internal edge. Um, and if we have concerns about landscaping and in-ground at grade landscaping, is that the, the place where we should be saying, well, no setback at the rear then prevents that at grade landscaping from happening to the extent that we'd like to see it. And that by agreeing to that through an LDP, we've already sacrificed what was a deemed to comply setback. Yes, through Mayor Cole, that's true to a degree. I think the other complicating factor is that a boundary wall to two storeys high is um, already a deemed to comply standard. So they could have a two storey boundary wall um, for a particular length as well. So there's other factors involved. So that, that's essentially a nil setback, um, but it becomes complicated because they've amended the rear setback requirement from 4.5 to nil. Um, and we haven't mentioned the boundary wall, the ability for them to build a two storey boundary wall along that frontage, which is essentially a nil setback anyway. Um, so currently, they can build boundary to boundary um, under the built form policy. Um, it's, it'll, it's about the length of which they can build that boundary wall. Um, so at the moment, it's two thirds um, the length of the, the property boundary, which is, so that, that means there's a third, that basically counts as allowing that extra third to be boundary to boundary. Um, of the of the length of the property, which means that um, the contradiction between the 15% or oh, the 12% now um, and that boundary to boundary increases slightly. But the contradiction's already there, so I don't see that it undermines our ability to achieve the deep soil planting, um, given the contradiction already exists between that and a number of other provisions in the um, in the in the policy, in the built form policy and in the R codes. Applicants have to do this all the time. They have to balance the, the various deemed to comply standards which contradict each other and meet them all. So providing that 15% or the 12% doesn't disappear. So can I just ask, are you saying there's no benefit in requiring a rear setback at all because of the two, because of the two story boundary wall provision? Yes, Sri Mayor Cole, I don't think that there would be a benefit the city could certainly explore, if council um, thought that that was important, could explore reducing the amount of that rear boundary that could be boundary wall, so that there has to be a setback for a particular percentage of it. Um, so that's something we could definitely investigate um, if you thought that that contradiction was sending the wrong message. Well, I think that we're sort of looking at where on ground landscaping could happen and given that there's no setbacks on the um, Fitzgerald Street, um, I think Cow Street is set back but at the higher level not at ground floor, is that correct from memory or is it set back one metre, I can't remember on Cow, Cow Street. Um, and then we've got the easement, the water corp easement 1.5 metres on either side and we're talking about trees and pot plants already and we're just at LDP stage. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're basically looking at where in the LDP does it create the space for some good deep soil zone plantings. Uh, I might just um, clarify the through you, Mayor Cole, the uh, gazetted version of the apartment design guidelines, which will be taking effect and will apply when um, this development, um, if it proceeds, will be assessed. Uh, the advertised version was 12%, but the gazetted version is 10%, and the language 
uh, for uh, sites which are very difficult to accommodate um, at the ground level uh, is that development includes deep soil areas or other infrastructure to support planting on structures with sufficient area and volume to sustain healthy plant and tree growth. So that's uh, it would be up to the proponent to uh, demonstrate that they could um, still meet um, the intent of that objective um, through something other than a deep soil area. Sorry, well, just, that's a bit just, of a change as to the original intent. Just, just, mm -hmm. for, just for clarity, what's the beginning of that sentence where he talks about where it's difficult to provide at ground? I would imagine if this is cleared as a vacant site of some many thousands of metres, the argument that it's difficult to provide would fall away. Oh, three. Through you make out no that difficult to provide that was my language, not the R code's language. So where that's the design intent to um, uh, build out the site. Also just had a question on the right of way widening. Because the report talks about the right of way being three metres in width, but the widening requirement is point five. Should it be a metre? It should be one point five. Uh, no, point seven five. 0.75 plus 0.75 is 1 point, no sorry, 1.5. I can't add up. Yes, it's definitely 1.5. I've already flagged that up. I'm going to find out tomorrow whether the width is 5 metres. I was told earlier today the width of that right of way is actually 5 metres, but I'm, I've already written myself a note to clarify that and I'll put that in the briefing notes. Okay, but I think I just still just want to explore whether we're giving away potentially too many concessions with the nil setbacks, particularly at the rear, if that's the only deemed to comply provision within our policy is that that should be a setback to the rear, which was the original intent of council's policy was to do that for landscaping and buffering. That's that's the part that I would just like to get further advice on. And also I just want to clarify, on the Cal Street side boundary we're talking about, they're seeking four, but we're looking at conditioning it to three storeys. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So currently it's two storeys um, for the adjoining property. Um, oh, let me check. And yes, two storeys is currently the deemed to comply standard, so we're, we're comfortable with three storeys given the adjoining properties, the current development that sits there, and that they could have a two storey boundary wall. Okay, so just, I guess, just to stress, I'm looking in the LDP to provide um, space at ground for deep soil landscaping, meaningful trees, etc. Because that's, I think, the area that's a little bit uncomfortable. Okay. Who was next? Councillor uh, Castle. Through you, Macol. Just, uh, I just want to clarify this, this discussion that we've just been having in relation to the process with the LDP. By, if we are to approve this in its current form, we're only approving a maximum envelope. Um, my first question is, does that limit any decision making capability that we or the DAP has in regards to the development application? So does that signal in, an intention to allow that full envelope to be developed um, in terms of, you know, it's, as in it's already approved in the LDP, therefore it should be approved in the DA? That's my first question. And if not, then does it also signal an intention of council to allow this type of development to happen, particularly given that it won't necessarily be this council that makes that decision? So if this presents to the DAP in a couple of years' time with the LDP as currently um, designed, would that be considered as an element by the DAP that council was obviously quite happy for it to be nil setback on all sides? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, having an LDP doesn't um, at all, is not a, not a relevant consideration that Council approved that LDP. So Council's decision to um, support an LDP wouldn't be a relevant consideration for the JDAP that, that Council supports a development of this scale on the site. What would be relevant is the provisions that were in the LDP themselves itself. Um, the way the, um, the R codes will, net, will work from the end of this week onwards um, is no longer, it's no longer the same as the way the R codes work. So the R codes um, 
have deemed to comply standards. If those standards are met, then the issue isn't discussed anymore. Um, you, you then get to the landscaping provision. If that's not met, then that becomes an issue. But um, So you need to meet all of them. But if you've met a deemed to comply standard, then the setback wouldn't be discussed any further. The way the new R codes work for apartments and mixed use developments such as this will be um, is that the acceptable outcomes, which are what this LDP is proposing to include, are just one part of the consideration. The main consideration is whether it meets the objective, the individual element objective for setbacks um, and for landscaping. So those will be the issues that are discussed and the impact of this LDP is actually a lot less than it would have been um, under the old R codes because even if you meet the acceptable outcome and the setback is provided, um, the element objective becomes the core issue and so um, which council can't amend through an LDP so it is what it is in the R codes um, and even if the acceptable outcome is met or the old deemed to comply standards met, that doesn't mean it's appropriate because an assessment still needs to be done about whether the overall development itself achieves the, the outcomes that the R code set in relation to landscaping and setbacks, etc. So I hope that uh, it's become more confusing, but I hope that clarifies it a little bit. I guess one follow up to that then is it is it possible to write into this LDP to reflect councils? potentially what their um, position is, which may be that nil setbacks are acceptable on one of those boundaries but not both, and that, that without necessarily saying that that landscaping we consider should happen at the rear but that it has to happen, um, is there a way for us to build that into this LDP so that it is quite clear um, that while nil setback might be acceptable at the front or at the rear, not not necessarily at both. Yes, I think an objective through you, Mayor Cole, could be um, drafted up that makes it clear what the intent is, that nil setbacks are acceptable provided the in-ground planting that delivers canopy coverage um, is, is delivered uh, at, an, at an appropriate rate or whatever that is. At ground level, correct. In-ground, deep soil, zone, and mature canopy cover planting, yep. Sounds good, so we have a new objective. Okay, I still would like some advice on the rear setback still. Okay, Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, thank you, just a couple of things, just further to Councillor Castle's question, perhaps an advice note that just clarifies Council's understanding of the role of the LDP it would be helpful if at some future point a consultant took a different view to the uh, current Director of Development Services about the value of the LDP and the setbacks that are shown in there, so that just might be helpful uh, uh, to accompany the, the recommendation. My question relates to uh, part 2.4 of the recommendation, which uh, refers to local planning policy 7.7.1. Uh, what validity does that have if that policy is rescinded and replaced by something else at the time when a DA comes in? So, for instance, if the parking if it just has a different name but the parking restrictions were greater, lesser or otherwise, is there a catch-all that says the policy of the day or if that policy no longer exists, does it then mean that the LDP doesn't have to address that particular policy? And that would be the same, I guess, for the state planning policies. So if this comes back in six years' time and those policies have changed by number or by reference, uh, do we need a catch-all in there to say that it's the prevailing policy of the day? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we would, there may be a need to, to clarify that. Um, so we'll have a look at adding a little asterisk and a, um, a clarification point at the end of the LDP. But just to be clear, if, if that parking policy is replaced by a new parking policy, the intent is that the new parking policy is what applies. And the same with the R codes. If the R codes changes, then whatever replaces the R codes is what is intended to be applied there. So we'll make sure that um, we add a little note to clarify that at the bottom of the LDP. 
councillors? Councillor Gondoszewski. Um, just one in relation to the active frontages. I note that it says the auditorium or any auditorium would be exempt from any active frontage requirements and just whether it has been assessed around um, whether it would have merit in specifying a, I guess, proportion of, say, a, yeah, the Fitzgerald straight frontage or um, a key frontage that would be acceptable to, um, in that regard, because I don't see that clause is actually providing for an active frontage if the entire frontage is auditorium. Could I just get some commentary on that? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. The active frontage provision uh, isn't, doesn't supersede any of the other provisions that exist in the built form policy or the R codes. So we didn't have a concern um, with that auditorium exemption because the, all of the other provisions around active frontages that are set out in the built form policy would still apply anyway. But there, what, there would probably be value in making it clear exactly what the proportion is because the applicant's not proposing a significant proportion. It was about a quarter, I think, from memory of that <coughs> half of the site. So it's not a significant area um, and it would provide clarity again um, if a proportion was included. So we'll go back and speak to them about that and see if we can have that added in. Councillors, um, I did speak to the director earlier in the week just to say that because there are quite a lot of conditions um, conditioned um, in the recommendation that I would personally find it very useful to have a third column added to the table that says, so you've got your deemed to comply, the proposal and the proposed um, condition, just so that it could be read across the page. So for example, where you've got Mills set back to the rear is recommended, etc. So is that possible? Yes, through Mechol, we can, we will, and we already have started looking at providing in that um, summary assessment the actual outcome and recommendation that, um, so that there's one table that sets all of that out. It'll obviously be a summary version, but um, yep. I think it's achievable. Yep. That would be great. Thank you. Are there any further questions on the LDP? Okay, great. Next item is 5.3 <coughs> review of policy number 3.8.12, mobile food vendor. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. A couple of questions. Um, firstly, policy provision 1.3, which says the amenity and appearance the, uh, that the food vendors must have a vehicle whose presentation contributes to the character and energy of the area. Um, who adjudicates whether that does or doesn't, and particularly in the event of a complaint where somebody feels that it doesn't, whose decision is that? Is that the officer, the ranger? Do we go to consultation? Does it come to the chamber? Who actually decides whether it does or doesn't? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the coordinator uh, of health services is here who assesses these um, regularly. So I might hand to her to advise on how applications are dealt with. Um, it's more specifically complaints. If somebody says, I don't like the look of that vehicle, it looks unkept, for example, and I don't think it adds to the character of the area and it contravenes the policy, what's the, what's the procedure from there? Uh, yeah, through you, Meko. Uh, so upon application, we do receive pictures so that um, of the vendors or, and the vans. Um, so we would make that assessment or judgment at the time of application. Uh, in terms of reviewing that, if it didn't fit within the presentation, that would be at an officer's level discretion. So yeah, that would go through administration uh, and yeah, the assessing officer and come through me as coordinator. Cool. Um, and... I uh, had another couple of questions. So in terms of um, noise in particular, so uh, there's a variety of views about what is appropriate noise in, uh, within a reserve, and that can be at different times of day, different times of year, etc. cetera. Um, the, what, are the reg, uh, what are the regs in terms of uh, generators or otherwise, and whether, uh, is there any uh, mechanism by which we can either restrict the level of noise or the hours of operation because my understanding from people who have had issue with it relates to uh, the, both the, the, the volume itself and also the, the 
frequency and the infrequency of it starting up and uh, and and disappearing when it, when that becomes an issue. Uh, yes, through you, Michael. Um, the Environmental Protection Noise Regulation sets out assigned levels. So, uh, if the complaint was um, investigated, we would go through the process of conducting an assessment using a sound level monitoring device um, and we'd be assessing that against the regulation. So that would take into consideration the what's called the modulation um, or the, the um, kick in, kick out of a generator uh, if that was within the sound that is measured. Um, so if, if it got to the point of um, taking those sound level measurements in the investigation, we have set assigned levels um, within the noise regulations. Um. And do thank you for that. In terms of uh, food standards or uh, health, do we have the same rights of entry and access to mobile vendors as we do to permanent premises for inspection? Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we would be able to inspect them at, at any time without notice. Thank you. And in terms of consultation, uh, I understand, so I, I see what, what's proposed, and it talks about um, proposed that we will be going to uh, landowners and occupiers within proximity. Is that how are we defining proximity? Is that immediately adjoining reserves? Is it within a radius model? What, what's actually proximate to the reserve or to the trading zone? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, it would be adjoining or adjacent to the reserves. Um, yeah. Okay, we're still going, Councillor Toppelberg, are you? No. Done. Thank you. No, okay. Councillor Murphy. Sorry, just on that um, consultation topic, is there any plans to actually consult the users of the parks themselves? Do you know from the city's view? Um, so we haven't actively gone out to do that as yet. Um, we have put within the report some just incidental feedback we received from um, people using the vendors uh, when we were conducting inspections or reviewing their their use of the reserves um, and that incidental feedback suggested that they were you know, supportive of the, of the vendors uh, but obviously that is quite limited scope um, so we could incorporate something like that if that's what council would be looking to do like. It's a good question because it will be going out to advertising but whether we could actually have signage at the parks where the food vendors are operating that would be worth considering. Um, can I just ask, just following up on the issue of the um, generators, so Clause 1 talks about amenity and appearance. Do you think it could be considered to add a clause, say, 1.5, that talked about minimising um, generator noise um, through... I don't know, there's various ways to do it, isn't there? Um, yeah, can, is that something that we could explore? Do you think? Do you, are you sort of saying that as long as it's within assigned levels, it's within assigned levels and it's not an issue, or do you think that we could actually um, sort of uh, state in the policy that measures to reduce impacts of noise through generator use, etc., would be, um, you know, rather than mandated but encouraged, and some suggestions about how that could happen. Sure. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, as part of any noise investigation, um, the assessment against the assigned levels would come as only part of that investigation. And if the matter of the um, nuisance being caused by the noise could be resolved by management measures or um, merely implementing, you know, a dampening effect of or of the type of noise, um, then we would recommend that the the vendor would implement that first. Um, it's only where we have to have a um, an enforce well, not an enforcement tool but a measure um, where we would refer to the regulations um, so yeah we could investigate something along those lines that we would seek for the applicant to or the vendor to explore those options first if a noise complaint was received but does it have to be in relation to noise complaint or could it just be as part of the amenity and appearance of the food trucks that would be um, encouraging them to minimize the noise caused through generator through various methods without it actually having to be a noise complaint? Yes. Given uh, that that issue sometimes gets raised about the noise in the parks through generators? Sure. Uh, yes, uh, through you, Nicole. We, the, obviously, um, 
mobile food vendors are generally heavily reliant on generators, so I would think a predominant amount of them would have them. Um, but upon application, we could review the, you know, the nature and type of generator that they use um, and see if they are already investigating it. Is that something that you... Well, look, I'm not seeking to say you must <laughs> have this type of generator or you must do this because I think that would mean that quite a few operators would just go, well, I simply can't afford that right now, so therefore I don't meet the policy and I can't, you know, can't be in the city of Vincent. What I'm saying is could we sort of encourage through the policy to con encourage operators to consider noise of generators and how they might ameliorate that without it being prescriptive? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. I think the location is probably quite an important factor, having it behind um, the food truck rather than on the side. Um, I've seen those scenarios where the placement of that generator can be probably the, the crucial issue. So um, I think that there are probably, that's probably just one example that off the top of my head. So we'll, we'll give it some thought this week. I, I, can't, I can't see why there couldn't be a provision in there that requires them location and the management of that generator to be um, something that is part of the application and they need to demonstrate that they're going to minimise the impact on the amenity um, before they get an approval. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. We're moving on from development services in your three. So I did have one further. No, you did? Okay. Um, there was a concern raised via email today in relation to um, food vendors being in Hyde Park and that it that potentially needed approval from the Heritage Office because they were, whilst they were temporary, the, the ongoing uh, and, and designating an area may give rise to the need for permission. If we can just clarify that and get some commentary in the briefing notes, please. Yes, Sri Mayor Cole will take that on notice and provide them the briefing notes. Thank you. Moving on. Thank you very much for that. We're moving to engineering now. Oh, sorry. Um, Infrastructure and Environment. 6.1 2019 Greening Vincent Garden Awards. Exciting. Any questions? Uh, hang on, let's just recheck the dates. Um, so the the judging does take um, does occur during the election period, but it is really quite limited to the gardens that you're visiting, and no one will be allowed to electioneer. <laughs> um, but the actual night is on is in November post um, election period. What about campaign t-shirts, Mayor. <laughs> Perhaps yeah, I'll just, just have to hand you over to the CEO to just raising some and under the new concerns. election period policy he can advise. Um, are there any questions and also are there any is there anyone who's keen? Yes. <laughs> I just lost it. Um, no, as much as I would love to do it again, I would like to Keep it open to other council members. Highly recommend it. Um, I had just have a question about the best kept verge category. I recall that last year we discussed having just uh, approved our new verge policy about having a category that included something about around verge decorations or tree houses or. Well, my question is, does that, yeah, does that include it in Best Kept Verge? Could we reword that? And can Most we innovative Verge? Yes. Uh, well, I guess the first question is, that is that what we're looking for in a Best Kept Verge? Um, and do we have any criteria included in that that includes, uh, you know, a very creative treehouse, etc. Um, and also whether our criteria might include positive or negative points for having a car bay on your verge. Yes, because if it was, you know, nicely um, brick paved with a car, it could be kept well, but it would not be at all what we're thinking about. 
Yeah. It concerns me that that might not actually even align with just, our um, even objectives. Even best verge would be better than best kept verge, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I guess perhaps a little bit of thought before that. CEO is suggesting the best Vincent verge. Yes, I love it. Sounds yep. great. We'll, have, we'll go with that. Um, but well, just a bit of thought about... Do you need it as an amendment put by <laughs> Councillor Castle? <laughs> that <laughs> criteria. Um, in relation to both sustainability and parking... What's our position on car bays on verges? Through you, Michael. Um, it's quite, it's quite, a, quite a lot of information in that question, so <laughs> I'm, rel I'm reluctant to give a quick answer. I think changing the name is not a problem, and uh, you're right, the change in the policy last year means that it does open up the judging to something different to what we previously have done. Uh, what I can do is speak to the manager of Parks and Urban Green and talk about the specific criteria uh, and put some information out in the briefing notes if that's acceptable to you. As long as it's clearly um, communicated to the judges on the day, that's the main thing. Through you, Michael, we uh, will endeavour to give full training to the selected judges. But we also have new provisions in our verge policy about how much hard paving you can have on the verge. It was 50%. Did we leave it at that or did we ch make it lower? Uh, through my call, I'll need to check that. Um, any volunteers? I'll volunteer. Good on you, Councillor Harley. Although, I'll wear all of your T-shirts. Um, Councillor Harley, are you sure you wish to volunteer? It's because this, the actual... Um, the, one minute. Yeah, the awards night is post-election. Yes. And yes, OK. Free meal as a private citizen. <laughs> okay, we have one volunteer. <laughs> Think about it then over the week, because next week we will be live and we'll be picking people. So, yep. Any other questions about the event itself? Um, I did have a question. Last year there was a bit of a change where we got the cheque directly from the Water Corporation and the Claysbrook Catchment Group for a long time has received the cheque and handed the cheque to the City of Vincent. Um, so I just want to make sure that we do the right thing with that relationship and if we, there is a change we need to talk with Claysbrook um, Catchment Group but it has been a long-standing um, relationship and involvement in the awards. So. If there is a change, I'd like to know why um, why we wouldn't include Claysbrook Catchment Group. Is it because the Water Corp, for example, is saying this is our prize money that we would like acknowledged and it's coming directly to the City of Vincent for sponsorship purposes as opposed to sort of going through a community group? Like, for example, that, you know, if the Water Corp have said we want to have branding and this is our sponsorship directly, then I think we just need to understand why that change has been made. Yeah, through you, Michael. My understanding was the cheque always was, you know, um, paid to the City of Vincent and it came through the group. But I'll uh, find out what's going to happen this year in terms of the planning of that and um, we'll endeavour to include the Claysbrook group because I know it's important as a long relationship. And if you could also just get some advice from Water Corp if they're happy for that to continue as well. Thank you. Councillor Toppleberg. Just in terms of the voucher pack, um, how, if local businesses want to be included in that, what's the avenue for them to uh, find out that they could be included in that if they're wanting to promote themselves in that in that way? <coughs> yeah, through you, Michael. Um, that's dealt with through our marketing team, so I'll find out that information and put it in the briefing notes. It's a very good suggestion because I think over the last 12 months or two years we've had a lot of indoor plant shops pop up in the city of Vincent like you know a good handful so it is an opportunity to go out to some of those new businesses and see if they'd like to be involved and through you Michael I may say one thing last year there was cash prizes and uh, that was a, que um, a request from council we did it through local businesses so we've done that so I'll put some more information in the notes any other questions okay <coughs> Uh, next item is 6.2, Review of Infrastructure and Environment Policies Relating to Parks. Oh, all the hands went up. Councillor Hallett. 
Uh, thank you to the Director of Infrastructure and Environment. Um, just in relation to the policy prohibiting sexes with animals, um, is admin aware of any other policies that the single clause in that policy could be moved to? Uh, yes, yeah, through you, Michael. Uh, I'll, I'll look right, but that uh, the intention is to include that in the leasing policy, which is uh, on its way to council in the not too distant future. I guess pending that, um, just to flag an, an an amendment for potentially removing that um, from the policy. Just to follow up to that question, Director, does it need to be in a policy or could it be in a facility hire procedure? Or that might actually be to you, Director. Yep. Uh, through Mayor Cole, that, that is actually the intention. Uh, community partnerships are actually reviewing all of their policies at the moment and it's the policy that rate relates to a hire uh, and conditions of hire for our reserves. So that's where we're looking to um, include this wording. Thank you. Um, Councillor Lowden. A question on process. Would we have the ability to approve the repeal of a policy subject to it being included in in uh, a, a, another policy or procedure and so this would basically stay in place until that was done? Uh, through you, Michael, I'm sure that we could uh, draft something that would achieve that outcome. I think the recommendation would need to clearly state that, though. The need to say that repeals the following policies, blah, 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 subject to blah, blah, blah. So I think that um, if administration can... I oh know, it's a um, wordsmithing. <laughs> if administration can consider that, otherwise it would have to come up as an amendment. Um, may I just ask, in relation to the... Uh, 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 water conservation and design guidelines? No. Yeah. Um, sorry, let me get to my questions. Um, in, oh, sorry, in relation to natural vegetation, um, I just wondered around um, whether the city has a position around the use of glyphosate. I always say that incorrectly, so my apologies. Um, the uh, that would potentially provide a policy position in relation to the use or discouraged use, or etc., in relation to that product. Yeah, through you, Michael, the, you'll notice there are some changes in the policy that remove the use of some of those um, uh, chemicals. Uh, but what I can do is uh, be a bit clearer about that in the briefing notes, just to bring that, draw that out, so it's clearer for elected members. And also, just in relation to whether the procedure content had considered to be removed and, or moved to a internal procedure versus a um, council policy, whether that had been considered in relation to this review. Um, through you, Michael, that is something we did consider and uh, we'd be happy to reconsider. We've done it in the past. You can see that there are, you know, the document is splitting two with a clear policy position and then some guidelines. Uh, administration is not against um, shortening the policy document and leaving the other matters to an internal guidance document. If council were happy with that. It certainly was considered in the discussions. Um, look, I would add to that. I read, for, first of all, with the, with the one that's been um, retained, recommended to be retained, are those policy statement provisions already captured in the greening plan is the first question. So in relation to things like providing areas of habitat for wildlife, um, ensure um, indigenous species are being used, etc. Um, if we could maybe just have some advice on whether those policy objectives or given that it would then be a one-page standalone policy, if those objectives are already contained in the greening plan, is it necessary? And just in relation to the part that has um, been 
you know, that is potentially now being looked at as administration as just being guidelines rather than uh, operational guidelines rather than being attached to a policy. Um, where it talks about herbicide use, etc., it doesn't seem to sort of talk about the contemporary practices that the city of Vincent has <coughs> moved to in rela relation to using um, glyphosate. I can never say it pro properly. Glyphosate versus palagronic acid. That's what I mean. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I think, I think that if that's going to disappear into operational land, I think it could still be updated to reflect current practices in herbicides. And then I'm questioning whether we actually need this policy if that's already reflected in the greening plan. Okay, through you, Michael, we'll do some work and um, put some information out in the notes. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Hallett. So just um, a follow-up in relation to um, moving a policy into a leasing requirement document, um, how that affects the status of it and whether that can be then deleted in the future through delegation um, rather than council um, choosing to change it. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I think it's something we will look at in terms of uh, administration is really clear around um, the intent to continue the prohibition um, of circuses and we're comfortable that that is best placed in an alternate policy which is currently under review. We'll just need to look at, um, I guess, the chronology of that happening. Uh, certainly if we simply <laughs> proceeded as per the current recommendations um, or had an alternate to retain that policy, um, then the mechanism would be to um, come back to council to formally revoke or repeal that. Um, so we'll look at that a little bit closer and what our options are, understanding what administration and council's likely intent is and report that in the briefing notes and then possibly change our approach for next week. Any further questions? Okay. Next item is uh, Corporate Services 7.1 Investment Report as at 30th of April 2019. Any questions? Yes. Um, this might need to be on notice, but um, I think at the last meeting we asked about um, that someone was taking, doing a project um, on evaluating this and whether we can just get an update um, on investment, particularly in relation to the fossil fuel divestment stuff. Matthew, Mayor Collar, we'll take that on notice and provide an update. Any other questions? Okay, 7.2, authorisation of expenditure for the period 1st of April to 30th of April 2019. Councillor Gondoshevsky. I have a couple of questions and happy for them all to be taken on notice. Um, and I think that, I'm, I'm sorry, I think they would cr cross a number of directorates. Um, how do we measure or are we measuring the impact of our social media influencer posts? Um, is the spring water that we are purchasing or providing at, um, at events in plastic or other single-use packaging or is it in, um, what sort of packaging is it in? Are cleaning wipes for the gym biodegradable? Um, I believe that there's a description uh, update that would need to be made in relation to council meeting fees and the ICT allowance description for this month as well. Which council meetings have coffee? Because it says there's council meetings that have coffee and I'm quite... I, I know, exactly right. Um, and I think I've possibly asked this before, so apologies. This may be a question I ask every year and, and um, forget, but do we have usage stats for the profile ID subscription, either internally or external, um, that would... Um, and yeah, um, in, and is it used on an ongoing basis, or is it more just when we um, review um, policy, etc.? Uh, that's it. Are you happy to take those on notice? Yes, great. Okay. You want to answer the influence? The CEO would like to respond to the influencer post. We have had a media inquiry from the vo Perth Voice on this item today, so the CEO is probably prepared. Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, Yes, um, we, we can track uh, how useful or what sort of reach we got through uh, influencer posts 
um, how many people have seen it, liked it or commented on it, and depending on the campaign, um, we can see these are translated into analytics within our other digital channels such as a boost in website visitors or the number of people who have visited a particular web, a web page. So on a particular initiative or campaign, we can do a report and, and get the metrics about what reach we think that um, provided throughout our other electronic forms of communication and we can make that available. Um, but essentially, so the, the primary means is to use the social media influencers to direct um, uh, Customers, clients, residents, ratepayers, etc., towards our own digital channels. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And through you, Mayor Cole, just in relation to the forecast ID, just to just to clarify, um, so it is used internally um, whenever we're reviewing, or mainly by the uh, policy and place team. Uh, I'm sure there are other sections of the city that use it as well. Um, to determine what the future growth is. I, I know finance use it as well when they're uh, preparing the budget to understand um, what the expected growth is, particularly for the LTFP, um, pro uh, projected growth in rates revenue, for instance. We do that every year as well as um, for the longer term. Um, so that's one of the bases and one of the um, piece of information that feeds in. Um, we also do it as part of all the strategies we develop, so the POS strategy, what the likely growth in population is going to be, etc. Um, and it's also available for businesses in particular when they're doing research about opening a new business or expanding their business to understand um, what the likely growth is going to be in the market for their their business. Um, I'm not sure if we have the usage stats, but we'll um, see if we can get those and provide those through. Any further questions? Okay, thank you. Um, next item is the late report financial statements as at 30th of April 2019. Any questions? Um, I have a question in regards to item 9, which is to do the Beatty Park Leisure Centre and the financial position. I note that there's some additional notes, but just uh, for the record, um, the operating deficit um, has increased to 1,521,906 um, compared to the budgeted amount of 1,450,905. And I'm just wanting to know what activities are happening um, in around that operating deficit to reduce it. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, yes, uh, there, there's a number of reasons for the current budget position um, at Beattie Park. Um, one of the main challenges we did have um, in the lead up to Christmas and through the, the summer months, the school holiday period, was um, the fact that summer never really hit. It was a long summer, um, but there were far less um, days over 38 degrees, and that's where we really do see an increase, particularly in swim entries and, and casual swim. Um, what the management team have been doing since um, around about January is managing um, our expenditure accordingly. Uh, revenue for the most part has um, been relatively close to budget in terms of swim school and memberships but uh, what we do do in the second six months of every financial year at Beattie Park is um, just manage our expenditure accordingly and that's something that that you will note and I can comment on further in the briefing notes is that since January um, we have kept our expenditure generally lower um, than what was budgeted um, in recognition that revenue um, is indeed lower than budgeted. So it's certainly something that we do monitor quite closely month by month. There are a number of um, reasons um, for the, the lower anticipated revenue but swim school numbers do remain relatively strong and so do the, the membership numbers. So it is that casual entry that, that has had a big impact um, and it's something that uh, we continue to focus on. Internal cost allocations is, is another um, big factor in the bottom line at, at Beattie Park. The, you will note on page 82 that depreciation is um, taken out um, to give a bottom line position, but we don't actually provide council members with a bottom line position um, not including internal cost allocations. Uh, and that is something I think important for administration to report both to council members and to the broader community because our internal cost allocations are um, give or take around about a million dollars. Um, and so if that isn't included on the bottom line and you have a I guess a controllable budget position presented to council members, it does present a, a very different um, picture. But um, 
I welcome the question and certainly happy to provide some more detailed information in the briefing notes um, in collaboration with the Centre Manager. Councillors, um, I look I just have to ask again, we've got two months, couple of works expenditure, how are we tracking? It looks like we've got a lot of money to spend. Uh, through you, Michael, um, better than the report looks, because the report is always uh, at least a month behind schedule. So you'll see, uh, <coughs> for example, some of the plant and equipment. You made a decision last council um, to award a tender for two waste trucks. Uh, we've also ordered a high waste truck, so that's nearly a million dollars of expenditure, which isn't reflected in this report. <coughs> Uh, the money may well be carried forward because the vehicles will not be delivered this financial year just because of the time it takes to build them, but the money is committed. So so in terms of delivery of projects, I think it's going very well, one of the best years we've had. It's not necessarily reflected in this report because of the way the report is presented. Councillors, okay. Next item, 7.5. Realignment of City of Vincent district boundary at the intersection of Charles Green and Walcott Streets, North Perth, and dedication of adjoining private right of way. Any questions? No. 7.6 Termination of sublease portion of Woodville Reserve, 10 Farmer Street, North Perth, Multicultural Services Centre of WA Incorporated. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, pending the Woodville of master plans. This is a question I would guess to the Director of Community Engagement, potentially, or the or Infrastructure and Environment. Um, I assume that the uh, eight vehicles that Multicultural Services have parked on the Farmer Street side of uh, the reserve will no longer be required there. If you look at the Google Maps image of the car park, I think there's 24 vehicles parked in that space at the time when that image was taken. Uh, is there an interim? Is there an interim plan for I know that it's, well, I assume it's potentially used casually, whether it be by people for the men's shed or otherwise, but is there a view on the car parking and access to that part of the reserve uh, whilst we're awaiting the outcome of the master plan? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, I've been there a couple of times over recent weeks and obviously the buses are no longer there. Um, that, that's a, a positive thing, I think, for the amenity of Woodville Reserve. Um, you are right, it's generally used for car parking associated with the Vincent Men's Shed um, and there's also currently a caravan there that belongs to the Rotary Club um, in terms of Hyde Park Fair, um, which is something I, I think we should also look to possibly relocate to improve the amenity uh, of the reserve. Um, Certainly, certainly the, uh, the the previous master plan that was done for Woodville Reserve, I guess one of the limitations for that is it didn't actually properly consider connectivity and pedestrian flow and traffic management and car parking requirements associated with the reserve. Administration's view generally in terms of approaching the master plan is to reduce the use of the reserve itself um, for car parking um, and to return as much as possible back to parkland. That will certainly be a, a driving factor um, for the master plan, I'm sure. Having said that, uh, there are limited street on-street parking options available around Woodville Reserve, so no doubt some level of car parking will need to be considered. So I wouldn't anticipate any significant changes in the short term. Um, Pop-up play has emerged on the other side of Woodville Reserve, so um, and given the fact that it's used by the men's shed for car parking at the moment, I would anticipate it will remain in its relatively same condition until we have some kind of clarity through the master plan. Councillors, any further questions? Councillor Gondoshevsky? Um, I can appreciate uh, the not wanting to do significant capital works to the site in relation to the pending master plan. I was just wondering, in relation to not requiring the repainting of the building prior to the termination of the, the sublease, um, I was just wondering if we could, um, if there was an assessment of the, um, I don't know, where, where the paint is at in terms of re requirement for renewal. Um, if there is, and if given that there is, there was a bit of an intention to try and utilise the space during that um, impending or you know intervening period. Through you, Mayor Cole, an inspection of the premises has been undertaken, and the paint is in a reasonable condition. So, on that basis, we believe it can be at least to someone else in the interim to like a decision being made on its use under the master plan. 
Um, and just in relation to um, the information around the rent and other expenditure and, and depreciation, um, so if was if the rent and other expenditure is about six thousand four hundred, and the depreciation is thirteen thousand. I guess um, what this is a general question, just in terms of um, what proportion of depreciation is that I, I recall that there is a, a, a figure and I think it's maybe 85% Councillor Lode might recall um, in relation to what is ex what would be expected um, in terms of a depreciation figure um, to be expended on maintenance or renewal of a facility such as this and I was just wondering whether that has occurred. So you, Michael, um, I'll take that question on notice if that's okay. Any further questions? The repainting one was a good question. That was what I was keen to know. Um, can I ask, um, Manager of Governance, when was it last painted? It's only said it's in reasonable condition, but is it? If they sort of said when they did actually last paint. We can take it on notice yeah. if you like. Um, through you, Mecca, I have to take that question on notice. Thank you. Okay, um, next item is 7.8, report and minutes of audit committee meeting held on the 9th of April 2019. This is one of the items that does have confidential legal advice attached, which we can discuss in confidential session if wished. Any questions? Um, I have some questions on the legal advice, uh, so if that could be considered during the confidential section, that'd be great. Thank you, Councillor Lowden. We'll do that. Item 7.9, amendments to the City's Policy 4.1.1 .1, Policy Register. Any questions on this item? Well, I do. Um, on this item, I feel like there's a bit of uh, potential to address other issues. Where did I write my notes? Um, what, just wanted to seek some advice. Um, one of the issues that's been coming up a lot recently is development of policy and seeking council input into the development of those um, <laughs> starting principles and objectives and whether the um, issue of um, that needs to be included in this policy and also I keep going on about a policy structure and whether this is potentially the place for that to um, to live. I feel that uh, you know these are issues that have been arising and have been discussed and just seeking some advice about whether this policy actually really goes far enough in describing the contemporary approach to policy development at the City of Vincent and the need for a um, policy hierarchy. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, just on the first uh, point about council involvement in policies, uh, part of the intent of updating this policy is to uh, start a much more rigorous process of reviewing and updating a large number of uh, outdated policies and we can bring um, that list of the full list of policies and where our initial assessment is at um, to Council um, for discussion and we have asked all teams to uh, review their policies they're responsible for and start bringing those to Council on a much more regular basis as a general rule once a policy gets over five years old or in some cases 10 or 15 or 20 years old uh, it's just a matter of time where it's going to cause us problems because um, we are essentially operating under outdated policies with um, bad cross-referencing against other uh, regulations or rules or policies that may have um, come online since those policies were last reviewed um, we can certainly add an attachment or bring that to council in terms of the policy hierarchy and how the uh, system of local laws, um, strategies, policies and operational guidance um, fits into what is currently a large and unwieldy um, list of uh, old policies which have been um, added to over time for good reasons at the time but now there's a complete 
disconnect between a single policy and uh, the, the full suite. So there's not much um, uh, there's not much logic to the current policy list and suite as it's um, formulated. So we're going to spend um, time and effort at the officer level over the next 12 months to uh, bring those to council for review and update. I guess what I'm asking is does this policy provide enough guidance to administration on, on council policy development and by adding things like a policy hierarchy and on having further comment on policy development that that may then in help inform that review of the long list of policies that need to be reviewed. So for example, the, current, the policy statement says, new policies will be presented to Council for adoption, subject to the provision of local public notice for a period of at least 21 days. Does that deal with the issue of the way in which Council is seeking to set the objectives of policy before a policy is simply presented in its full draft format to council for adoption. I think that's something I'm, you know, this policy could actually inform that process better, could inform the policy structure better, so that when when you're going through that review policy, you've actually got some guidance here that does actually mean that policy development is happening in the way that council would like to see that happen, and that staff have an understanding of what the different hierarchy of policies are, and therefore what the requirements for each of those documents are, depending on where they sit in the hierarchy. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, yes, we're, we've got the benefit now of starting this uh, review program with a very recent strategic community plan, which um, has the six priorities plus a lot of actions underneath that, which can help uh, inform where Council's priorities are. If we do circulate that full list with some summary commentary to uh, Council members, um, that might help us identify um, particular areas of interest uh, in terms of the current policy suite uh, as well as we can provide more guidance um, in the policy on um, the policy making process. Um, is that something that could be done by next Tuesday because I guess in terms of having a hierarchy of policy then you're saying like if it's a strategy then this sort of you know like it, it could actually be this is very very brief and it could actually be a lot more um, it could actually provide a lot more guidance to staff in terms of strategy development, policy development, and how to approach the different tiers under a hierarchy. But this in its current format is very simple. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, if we don't, don't provide sufficient information in response to those questions, then uh, we could certainly um, withdraw the item for consideration at a uh, council meeting later in the year. Councillor Gondoszewski. Um, I note that the policy that's uh, re recommended to be repealed um, talks about that new policy development shall incorporate consultation with elected members. Um, and uh, I wanted to check in relation to um, the city's consultation slash engagement policy slash charter, um, whether that sort of would be referenced there or whether it would be, um, as Mayor Cole has said, appropriate to include that direction within this policy? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, just to clarify, should this policy reference the community, was the question if this policy should reference um, the other policies related to community consultation? Four policies. Um, my question is whether the consultation policy that is being reviewed and going to be developed will that include reference to consultation and engagement with elected members, or is this the appropriate policy for consultation with elected members in relation to policy development to be um, recorded? Because my understanding is that it is recommended that we repeal the policy manual adoption and review policy and that specifically says that new policy development shall incorporate consultation with elected members and the policy statement in the proposed policy register policy talks about the development of policies in accordance with the following and a 
a number of dot points are listed there, but it would appear from that that the earliest point that Council is likely to be engaged if decision making is undertaken in accordance with this policy would be at the point at which a policy was presented for adoption. And so um, without you know, showing my hand potentially for next week, um, that's not the point at which I believe that engagement with elected members should occur. So I'll either flag significant amendment in that regard or I'd appreciate your guidance around what might occur in the consultation policy. Am I not being clear? Uh, the community consultation policy, uh, I don't think that just refers to the consultation we have with external members of the community and because that's the council policy, it's endorsed by council, it doesn't refer to council um, consulting itself about that um, policy. But we can certainly uh, provide more language in uh, the draft policy about council's role in um, overseeing um, policy development and uh, what we do want to achieve is having an ongoing regular program because we've got dozens and dozens of policies uh, to have um, clear council oversight of a annual program of policy review where we prioritise out of the, well we've got um, dozens of non-planning policies, we've got about 40 uh, planning policies as well. Uh, we want to have a monthly agenda with council to uh, move through a uh, prioritised systemic um, policy review program to uh, make sure we can get some of these policies uh, into more contemporary format. I can appreciate that. Um, I think that this policy, sh the way that this policy is developed perhaps would be a good um, demonstration project potentially for how that other policy review and development process could go. Um, I would, I'm not sure this is ready, but I uh, will see what comes in the briefing notes. Councillors, any further questions? Okay. Late report 7.10, adoption of council election period policy. Questions, Councillor Toppelberg? Thank you. Um, just can flag a couple of amendments, so I'll go through them just so that they're not surprises next week. So page one, uh, purpose, uh, second paragraph, to advantages or disadvantages of a particular candidate. I think that that's important, that um, particularly where staff may have a view on someone's candidacy or otherwise that they don't, the resources aren't used to potentially disadvantage a candidate. Uh, section two, part A, in this sentence I would propose to appear a couple of times, but would, uh, seek to amend to say that the Council of the City of Vincent making major decisions and insert the words that depart from its stated strategic direction. Um, I had spoken to the CEO about it but that same sentence would uh, preferably appear also uh, under publicity campaigns 5.9.3 which is on page 6 so during the election period major or new publicity uh, campaigns. <coughs> that depart from its stated strategic direction other than for the purpose of conducting and promoting the election would be avoided where possible. Um, to me that, oh, I'll talk to it next week, but I'll just flag those. Um, and I will ask the CEO, I did have a conversation with him yesterday. Uh, I have some concern in relation to the, uh, our role in the Local Government Act and particularly in relation to the contract of employment of the Chief Executive Officer, uh, that the policy seeks to make it impossible to terminate a CEO even though that may be a provision under the contract and in, it effectively says that the only thing that would be possible is to suspend them and wait for the incoming council to make a decision uh, without going to the specifics of our existing CEO's contract I, where a termination clause exists. I guess I'd like to seek some advice about the ability of a policy to uh, potentially limit what exists uh, under a contract and also how that relates to our role under the Local Government Act in uh, administering the contract and the CEO's employment. I might just ask the Mayor if she wants me to um, answer that question because it relates directly to, well, <laughs> it specifically doesn't relate directly to your 
contract, just okay, as, as, as a principle, as a principle where a termination... Perhaps you could rephrase it to say that if a CEO was found to engage in serious misconduct where there was clear evidence, it, it's what would the scenario... Where a, termination, where a contract exists and there are ter it is, is a termination clause that exists that provides guidance to the, uh, the uh, as to what would contradict grounds for termination, uh, is it? Are we able to have a policy that says that, if, notwithstanding the existence of that contract, this policy may actually prevent you from enacting what is in that contract? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, my response to that um, in relation to this policy and that specific question is a general response for the entire uh, draft policy, in that. Uh, this policy um, is only a guidance document. It um, doesn't override any other uh, legal obligation or responsibility that uh, council has. Um, the only, I guess, the, the point of the policy uh, would be that if council was going to make a decision which fits the criteria specified here for major decisions or significant expenditure or something to do with the um, CEO's employment, um, that council would need to be mindful uh, of this policy and just be very clear about the reasons why it's making a decision uh, during that election period and those reasons would probably relate to either urgency, uh, it's unavoidable, um, there's a legal obligation or requirement to make that or um, there's another uh, extraordinary circumstance why why council has decided to um, make that decision during the election period and as long as that's documented and understood then um, that uh, promotes transparency and, and accountability. So the policy um, provides guidance to council and to administration in uh, con conduct during the election period. Uh, it certainly doesn't say that co council or administration shouldn't con continue doing what it normally needs to do. It just needs to provide um, some reasons if it decides to bring a uh, matter um, for decision when otherwise um, it could be dealt with before or after that election period. Thank you for that. I, I will. I won't have it ready for now. But I just. I will talk with you and perhaps externally, as well with your uh, guidance. But the wording of it that says that 5.2 establishes that a CEO may not be appointed or dismissed. The appointed, I'd have no issue with, but the dismissed, uh, where that specifically is allowable under a contract. I just think that that could be worded better to better reflect uh, the our role in terms of management of, of a. CEO's employment contract, but I'll happily discuss that with you before next Tuesday. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, that language may be better phrased as uh, should not as opposed to may not. Um, I'm not sure if that's a, a substantive difference from the Council's perspective. Councillor Harley. Um, thank you, Councillor Topberg. I had um, similar questions in regards to um, talking about hierarchy of policies, hierarchy of contract law, um, obviously the Act and then where the policy fits in to um, disallow. Um, so I think those questions um, kind of answer, partially answer. Um, my questions relate to the accountability of the CEO um, in Section 5.1.2, major policy decision um, the um, E, decisions that in the CEO's opinion will have a significant impact on the City of Vincent. So my question is about how that opinion gets formed and what the accountability is for that opinion. And again, this um, question is not in relation to you um, specifically as a CEO. Um, so it's a general question um, about um, CEOs occasionally not being above um, uh, politics, but also sometimes getting it wrong. So I guess the word opinion, is that the right word um, uh, to be using in a policy a policy setting which talks about in the CEO's opinion for me my question is is that too subjective and is there a way that you could you could strengthen that um, I would expect it to be a documented decision um, at the least perhaps you could answer that uh, through you Mayor Cole uh, in relation to Councillor Harley's uh, point the the opinion I think we probably could re revise that language uh, the decision making would be essentially where uh, funded and um, authorised by council to deliver 200 odd 
uh, programs, projects, or services. It's all documented in the corporate business plan and the annual budget. Uh, it would be uh, D in terms of decisions. That would be um, substantial expenditure action that, um, in not really my opinion, but uh, in objective fact, um, committed us over and above what Council has approved in the budget, approved in the strategic community plan, or approved in um, the corporate business plan for our 100% uh, our of our current programs, projects and services. So there could be a way to phrase that within um, approved activity and uh, approved services. Do you, Mayor CEO, perhaps the wording that Councillor Topberg recommended earlier or put forward earlier may suffice or a form of that? Um, my, um, so thank you for that. My other question um, relates to 5.5.1. Um, and it was um, an, a matter raised at the workshop. Not all elected members are up for re-election every two years. So my question relates to the wording about differentiating between um, those those elected members who are not up for re yeah who are not candidates. Yep. Um, yes, that, that's correct. Um, and I understand that even um, elected members who are not up for re-election may sometimes seek to engage um, politically, but I feel it's an important distinction. If I could ask that you have a look at that and perhaps come up with some other suggestions for how um, elected members who are legally elected to do their job right up until the point they're no longer in the position can continue to do their job, um, but also those elected members who are not candidates um, do not have uh, restrictions placed on us unnecessarily. Yes, uh, three you make up. That was 5.5.1, was that the correct? That's fine. Um, and my other question relates to 5.6 in regards to public consultation. Um, and I raise concerns um, in regards to this part of it and in regards to the timing of when public consultation will not be undertaken during the election period. So just want to clarify for the public record, if a consultation period has commenced and 37 days prior to the election, that public consultation is still ongoing, will that public consultation be suspended for the 37 days of the election? Uh, th through you, Mayor Cole, yeah, in terms of this phrase uh, or that section of the policy, that would only be apply uh, in an instance where it was a significant new project or significant new <coughs> initiative um, over and above our normal uh, consultation on routine and, and operational uh, matters. So we'd have to fit that significant or, or major definition. Can I just clarify? So this is for consultation periods that Council um, may have set or will, will have set prior to the 37 day election period. So my question is, why would you propose to suspend that consultation when it's already been set at a council meeting prior to an election period of whether or no restrictions? It's during a public debate and, and public decision making. Why would you seek to restrict consultation during that period, as opposed to new, entering into new consultation? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, it's the last paragraph of section 5.6 that you're referring to, and that would be uh, where the issue that is being consulted upon um, could uh, easily or um, readily be identified as um, an election issue as opposed to a routine matter of uh, local government. And, a and the consultation would be over something that hadn't, um, a decision, a final decision hadn't been made on. So CEO, through you Chair, in whose opinion is it an election issue, that uh, an issue that may affect the outcome of an election. I'm concerned, actually this is about, I'm partially about protecting you as a CEO because um, there are some local governments where this could get a CEO into trouble. Uh, through you, so I still don't understand why you'd restrict consultation during the caretaker or the election period of 37 days which has already been set in place by a council decision filmed for all the world to see and all our decisions um, on the record in regards to that proposal. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the, 
decision making around that would have to um, be done on the merits of the issue. It'd be well, I could come up with some hypothetical examples, um, but that that would be speculative. It would be about not um, going through or the administration not committing to something uh, which be would become controversial during election period and for us to try to avoid having those uh, matters or having the administration being involved in those matters uh, during that period which could uh, influence um, an election result. For instance, if we were um, asked to or council had resolved to consult on something which was a live election issue for us to be actively going um, about through our social media channels or letters or pamphlets or postcards to be asking residents what they thought of something which council may have um, uh, decided upon before the election period uh, that could quite easily start confusing um, residents and voters on what the role of the administration is during that consultation process and what the role of candidates who may be expressing uh, similar or different views to that during the election period. So we'd seek to avoid that. That's an interesting answer. Can I just clarify what you said there? Because this part for me is really critical because it goes to the politics and it goes to the exercise of political judgment by the CEO and all staff and the potential infringement on the role of a councillor prior to an election period. So I just want to clarify, at what point would you as a CEO or would your um, staff form a view that something coming before a council meeting prior to an election period would somehow be controversial or maybe an election, an election issue? And do you think that, it's a leading question, that that is not calling for some political speculation on behalf of yourself as a CEO and your administration to preempt what might be the election issues that councillors may run on. <coughs> so this bit concerns me deeply because I believe it actually interferes with the role of us as council to make decisions in good faith prior to an election period. So my other question in relation to this is how far out from the election period will you make these assessments? Because some of our consultation periods vary in length. Some of them obviously statutory periods, um, obviously the statutory um, you know, planning consultation still rolls on. Do you think that there are instances where a planning matter, such as a large development on a major street with nil setbacks and no um, no trees, do you think that could potentially become, in theory, an election issue? And how are you as the CEO going to make a defensible decision in stopping or halting consultation on some things and not on others? So that's my significant concern about this. Uh, thanks. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, just to clarify, we wouldn't be stopping council making decisions um, before an election period, uh, there would be a conversation about what sort of consul, depending on what the issue is. Um, if it was a major new uh, initiative, there would be a conversation at council about the consultation process that we may wish to undertake for that, uh, and then um, around the timing of that as well. Um, it's quite clear in the policy that um, routine matters, operational matters, that consultation would. Uh, continue throughout this period uh, and there's a whole range of statutory obligations around particular decisions which may are being made um, during the course of the year uh, that we're obliged to fulfil and the planning, uh, the consultation um, around the Planning Development Act is um, not discretionary. Um, development applications will keep coming uh, in and they'll um, keep being um, sent out for consultation as we're required to uh, under the Act and, and the regulations. Councillor Castle and then Councillor Bonchewski. Uh Through you, Mayor Cole, just to follow up to that, um, I have some of the same concerns and I'm just wondering if, um, if I'm correct that the intention of this clause is that that would rarely be used or only in in extraordinary circumstances. Could we give some consideration to beefing up the, the wording of that? Uh, I mean, I think on the face of it, 
you could probably argue that every single consultation that we are conducting during that period has the ability to affect the result of the election. Um, so if that is the intention of the clause, then perhaps we could look at some wording to add, you know, to significantly affect the result of an uh, That's off the top of my head. That might not be the right phrasing. Um, but could, is that something we could consider before we make a decision next week? Um, just to make it very clear that really this is only going to happen in exceptional circumstances, if that's intended. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, it's nearly certainly the case that we'd only be dealing with exceptional circumstances. Um, it's phrased as a policy, but it's generally, generally viewed as a convention just to guide decision making around this um, slightly unique period uh, during um, the uh, electoral cycle. Um, the intent of the draft policy is to uh, help navigate some of those grey areas. It would be impossible to uh, predict what they are um, now, but when they arise, uh, it's important that staff throughout um, the city um, understand that decision making around major new contracts or um, major new expenditure or appointments um, are referred um, up to me and then uh, they can be managed um, in accordance with uh, this policy. It's um, the uh, intent of having the policy is never having to use it. I guess I guess the questions then um, really are aimed it, so that this policy doesn't make those grey areas more grey. That's my concern is that you're opening yourself up to um, more discussion about what does satisfy these particular um, clauses. Councillor Gonshevsky. Uh, just wording again. Um, in relation to the voluntary code of conduct, I was just wondering whether um, it would be uh, um, appropriate to talk about um, each candidate is encouraged to abide by the voluntary code of conduct if they intend to become a candidate in the election. Um, I feel that's probably more catches the voluntary essence of the code of conduct. Um, thank you, Councillor Gondrzewski. Um, I just have a few questions and I'm happy for you to take them on notice because there's a few. Um, just a small thing. It does talk about the public sector and I just think that um, we, we don't often describe ourselves as the public sector, so just wanting to make sure that that's the correct terminology for local government. I understand the broad intent there. Um, I think there's some, the wording is a little bit strange and I'm happy to provide some feedback during the week. Um, just things that, for example, that candidates are encouraged to cooperate with the implementation of the policy. I think that's a slightly oddly expressed. It does talk about the Lord Mayor under the definition of election day. Um, I'd like for the to request whether we could get some advice on electoral material um, and whether we feel this actually effectively captures modern communications because it does sound like old fashioned um, sort of handbills, pamphlets, notices. It doesn't really talk about social media and the electronic medium, which is huge in modern campaigning. Um, I would question whether the definition of major policy decision is actually a major policy decision because it's got so many um, subcategories under that from A to F where you're including under major policy decision a decision about employment termination or remuneration of the CEO, reports requested or initiated by an elected member and a candidate. I think that really could go back to the basics at the beginning of the, of the policy to say that this is about major decisions which go to the three dot points under purpose which is major policy decisions, making significant appointments, entering major contracts or undertaking so that it's consistent and it doesn't sort of go into very, very specific things under the heading of a major policy decision, which I don't think it is. Um, I 
also just in terms of 5.5.1, going back to that where it says that candidates, um, elected members who are candidates, if that form of wording will or won't be added, um, restricted to names, contact details, titles, membership of special committees and other bodies. Um, again, I think that this wording just doesn't fit Vincent. Membership of special committees. I think we just need to say in our own language is that membership of because the only committee we have is the audit committee and then other bodies is that working working advisory groups i think we just need to actually really be clear about what that is and if a councillor has an existing brief bio on the website and they're not changing it for election purposes does that need to be taken down like if everyone has their bio and it's on there and then it's like well you can't change it during a caretaker Provision. I'm not quite sure because it's almost like we shouldn't cease to exist in our roles. I think it just needs to ensure that we're not electioneering. So there's a question about whether the, our existing brief bios, provided they're not tampered with during election period, can remain in place. And just a language thing again, under 5.6 it talks about perceived as intended or calculated to affect the result of an election. It's just starting the language sounds a bit sinister. I just think it just really needs to be very clean language. Um, request for media advice 5.9.2. I think this also needs to be clear, similar to the earlier <coughs> provisions around the fact that council members continue in their role that um, under 5.9.2, I would like some acknowledgement that the role of the Mayor under the Local Government Act continues in the role of the spokesperson. I think that should come in under 5.9.2. And um, just on language again, 5.9.3 talks about publicity campaigns. We never talk about publicity campaigns, we talk about marketing campaigns. Just so the language is consistent so that... I think it's important that we have consistent language with the language that we use so that when staff and council members read this, we know what we're talking about. Uh, thanks, Mirko. I think we've got all those um, comments and um, points on uh, the language. Uh, just to just comment on the website, uh, it's currently inconsistent in terms of whether um, current um, elected members have just uh, the basic information or whether or not there's a paragraph of more personal uh, information and um, I think the point of that phrase which we can um, certainly look at is just to make sure there's some consistency there in terms of how councillors are described um, on the website. Just by way of background for the CEO, all council members have been invited to put the information that they wish on the website and it's sort of been left up to the council members to take up that if they wish to. Yeah, we're not changing the photo. <laughs> um, are there any other questions on the election? I just, I just had a, yes. a follow-up to your point about the profiles, is that if the decision is to remove them for um, elected members that are standing for re-election, then, uh, and I agree with your point that they probably shouldn't be removed, but. Um, then perhaps we could consider putting some notification on there to explain why they've been removed. <laughs> Councillor Toppleberg. Uh, thank you. Um, I did ask a question of the Mayor yesterday, but perhaps just get the CEO's view. Uh, given the time frame and the way in which uh, our CEO performance review process at Vincent is established effectively it's the uh, July to June period, which means somewhere between July and every second year up until 37 days before the second Saturday in October would be the discrete period if we wish to capture the feedback of the sitting elected members. Would uh, the CEO's performance review be considered a major decision in the context of a, an election policy or would that be fine to come to council because it, for obvious reason, would need to come, should be there before an election so that the sitting council actually gets to complete the review. Um, so would the intent be for that process to flow through and that decision to be brought to council during the election period? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, that's a normal um, and mandatory responsibility of council and um, should continue. And just as a follow-up, I have put together a draft 
time frame, and I do believe it's possible to do the performance review for the October. Uh, sorry, not October, for the August meeting, and that if that time frame was followed um, broadly each each year, then it should be okay, provided there are no hiccups. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item is uh, 8.1, Late Report Draft Safer Vincent Plan 2019 to 2022. Um, it did come in this afternoon, so I'm not sure the council members have had an opportunity to read it. If you haven't, we can always ask questions via email. Um, Councillor Hallett has a question. Um, through the Mayor to the Director of community and business, perhaps. Um, the plan refers to um, plan for the expansion and management of the city CCTV network. Just wondering if you can provide some more detail on the expansion um, aspect of that. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, that will actually be preempted by a review of the city's CCTV strategy, which um, does indeed um, expire this year. It was a conversation we actually had at the most recent Safer Vincent Advisory um, meeting and um, a commitment that administration did give to that group and, and the council members um, on that group was that uh, not dissimilar to a, to a conversation we're just having around the starting point for reviewing our major policies and strategies that um, key objectives should first be set with um, council members. So that's the, the first step that administration will be taking is um, forwarding um, some draft objectives to council members to initiate um, that CCTV strategy review um, and that and the outcomes from that review will then um, specifically inform this action. Mm. Any further questions? Um, Director, just checking, I think, I have because I haven't read this properly yet, but is this going to be formatted before it goes out for consultation? Through Mayor Cole, uh, yes, it will be. I, I don't know whether it will be formatted in time for next Tuesday um, yet, but certainly the, the formatting is in full swing, so I expect it to be done before it's released for public comment. Thank you. No more questions at this stage. We'll all read it and email questions. Okay, um, we've dealt with draft sustainable environment strategy. Are there any questions on item 9.2 information bulletin? Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just on the development stats, um, I note that uh, we've basically hovered between 105 and 116 development approvals outstanding since about September last year. Um, I'm aware we're in discussions around the resourcing at the moment, but to my understanding we're not increasing resourcing. Just wanted to understand what we'll be doing differently to continue to bring down the development stats there. Through you, Mayor Cole, I think we discussed this at the budget workshop. The, the city has got to a point now where the changes that we need to make are largely relate to our systems. Um, and our processes. So the process review that um, the city's just gone through has highlighted a number of um, process improvements that we can make. Um, most of these involve um, improvements to our systems and so require resourcing from IT or external consultants um, or internal um, resourcing within the directorate to support those changes and admin, admin support. All those resources exist. Um, the issues come down partly to um, you know, budgeting upgrades to our IT software, etc., making changes to the system. So um, most of those changes are things that will happen over the next few years and they're not going to happen as um, readily as um, the changes that the changes to personnel that have been made, the changes to the approach, um, and just generally uh, delivering better services for the community, um, which we've we've really exhausted, I think, over the last um, few years. So the the approach has certainly shifted now, and we've we've been workshopping in the last two weeks actually the delivery of those process improvements and how to stage them and implement them. So they're starting now, and they'll be implemented over the next few years. Um, it's not a and it's not a 
resourcing issue as in the number of planners. It's, a, um, it's an organisation-wide um, issue that we're addressing through um, the projects on a page, services on a page, um, and the CPP. So I hope that answers the question. So does that mean we're waiting on the ICT strategy to roll out for these things to happen? Or, I mean, are we sort of going to be sitting about this sort of number for the next year or two? Or is there going to be stuff happening in between that will help to address at least part of the issue? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we're not... The ICT strategy is a big part of it, um, but that's something that needs to come later because there's a number of things we can do and we are doing right now. So the online um, DA um, project is very close to being finalised and being implemented, so that will make a difference because we'll um, be able to receive applications without having to allocate resources to the front counter as, as much. So then that officer gets freed up a little bit more to deal with the development applications. Customers will have a better idea of where their application is at on the system. They can just go online and see whether advertising is commenced or, um, and so can the community. They can see exactly where the development application is at. So that will reduce the number of phone calls we get, the number of people coming in the front counter again freeing up officer time. So that's something that's happening and very close to being completed right now. A number of the other changes that we're making and improvements to the systems that we're making um, are happening and will continue to happen um, over the next few years while before the ICT strategy comes in. So one of the other big ones is where it, over the next financial year we'll be focusing on training our administration team so that they um, have the skills to update the existing authority system um, to improve our, our processes, our internal registers. So that the current situation is all of the registers and our processes were developed when authority was first implemented at the city and none of them have really changed much um, or at all. Or we rely very heavily on um, Civica, the external consultants, to come in and make a change when we need it made. So the training that we're looking to provide with IT support next financial year will allow the, the six admin officers we have in the directorate to actually deliver improvements and um, short, you know, put in assessment sheets, templates into the system so they're automatically generated and there's consistency across the board and the whole system and process runs a lot more smoothly and that will avoid us having to wait a month for Civica to have the the time to make that improvement and for, only for us to turn around and tell Civica well, actually you did it wrong, come back and finish the job for free because you haven't, you haven't done it right. So um, that, that's, that's another improvement we're making and there's a number of others that the team's been workshopping this week to prioritise um, to work out what will be delivered when. So we're not waiting for the ITC strategy but that is a fundamental part of it in the long run. Councillor, who's next? Councillor Toppelberg. Um, it's a question to you, Madam Mayor. Is it a fair summary of the Tamala Park sales strategy to say that we're knocking 10 grand off the prices and instead of giving incentives to the builders, we're giving a $2,000 kickback to the builder's sales reps if they bring qualified uh, sales leads to Tamala Park? Is that pretty much the summary of the current sales strategy? The CEO has asked that you don't use the term kickback. Uh, you could rephrase it. Okay, or well, I'll word it exactly as it's worded in the minutes as, as I read it, so I apologise. It's not, you're right, it is not a kickback. It is a sales incentive, I think, was the terminology that was used. Um, so I apologise if I've... The sales and marketing campaign. Uh, but effectively... Instead of builders receiving a discount for finishing early, the sales representatives of the builders who are not... So that their sales representatives are being paid by Tamala Park. If they bring qualified leads to that result in a sale, they'll get a direct financial yes, benefit. Is because that it's at the front end, because sales have been as low as one lot a month. So they're actually trying to incentivise the sales reps to actually bring the sales to the door as opposed to giving incentives to builders to complete early because they can't actually even get the sales happening. It's really dismal. Okay, that's understood. Uh, and I understand... Uh, actually, I've got, I've got a further question that I'll wait until we're in confidential session to ask you. 
Sure. Council Gondoshevsky. This is just following up from Council Odin's questions in relation to DAs. Um, in terms of the April 19 statistics where there's 21 that are currently over 90 days, do we know how many of those are like over 90 days where there's been a discussion with the applicant because they need to provide some information and there's some sort of approval versus, you know, like, because I, I guess the over, there's no stop the clock provisions in relation to this legislation, all those time frames is there, and certainly not in relation to this graph. So can I get some clarification? Well, Suri Mayor Cole, um, it's one of my big bugbears is that the reporting that we do doesn't actually represent um, the, because the, the regulations and our scheme through the regulations actually provides a stop the clock function where an applicant agrees to a, a different time frame, then the time frame, the statutory time frame becomes the agreed time frame. So almost everything that comes to council, I can't think of anything um, that comes to council has a an agreed time frame. So it's either within the 90 days or we've agreed a time frame with the applicant. And the same goes for all of the applications that we determine on delega delegated authority now. In the past, that wasn't the case because um, we weren't processing applications efficiently and um, we wouldn't have dared ask an applicant to agree a time frame because it, it wasn't reasonable. But we have reasonable time frames now. Applicants, it's applicants' choice whether an application comes to council and is determined in its current form or they, um, we give them additional time and they agree to have a month to redo their plans before it comes to council. And the same thing goes for delegated authority decisions. The issue we have is back to the, the systems. Um, we have no ability to capture that in the current authority register. So we need to get Civica to fix that problem. And when we've asked Civica to fix that problem, they've been unable to, to make that change. Um, and so unfortunately, we can't report on it because we would have to manually go through in an Excel spreadsheet um, for every application and, and do that work. So at the moment, we're just reporting on um, the amount of time it's been in rather than whether it's in within the statutory time frame or not. Um, and that's something that we're working on um, and we're, we're hoping that the administration team, once they have adequate training next financial year, maybe halfway through next financial year, we'll be able to um, change our reporting so that we can report on statutory timeframes. Um, I'm just noting it's going past 10 o'clock now, so we still have to discuss the confidential legal advice. Are there any further questions? Okay. All right, so that concludes the items for this evening, but there has been a request from council members to discuss the confidential legal advice containing confidential attachments for items 7.7 .7 and 7.8. So we will just have a um, confidential session to discuss that advice. So.